<laughs> so the Midnight Meat Train is based on a Clive Barker story, but here is the big thing. It's very 2008 and it's very Japanese. And Bradley okay. Cooper is in it, apparently. And Bradley Cooper is the main character, yeah. The director is Japanese. I haven't seen any of his other stuff, but I I ended up like looking up who directed it while I was watching it because the whole time watching it, I was like, this is a Clive Barker story, but this everything about the execution just screams American J-horror remake, you know, mm-hmm. like how The Ring yeah. has this very particular look to it. Midnight Meat Train has an awful lot of that. and. The visual stylizing of everything that happens in the movie, I think, is really, really neat because every single shot has a very particular look to it. And every now and then that look is just like incredibly stark, incredibly plain and like true to life sort of looking. Mm -hmm. But other times it's like, you know, crazy lighting and filters and shit. There's a, 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 a scene where a guy gets hit in the head with a hammer so hard that his eye pops out and it's fantastic it's just yeah it's, <laughs> it's insane when i googled the fights are all like anime shit it's crazy when i googled midnight meat train and went to images literally the first picture was a person with their eyes popping out of their head yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's a pretty fun movie i think it, would, uh, it might be neat to cover it on the podcast eventually i don't know what would you give it out of 10 though out of 10, I might give it like a like a like a 7.5. It's not like, you know, anything super, super special story wise or anything. Right. But like it is a neat experience to watch it. OK. And yeah. the relationships between the different characters are all kind of neat, even though none of them are actually important. Do we have any other ghouls to gab, though? Violent Night. Very fun. Nice. Uh, there are actually a lot of fun horror movie references in it that makes sense and i was the only one of my friends that caught them and so talking about them after the movie was really fun nice nice um and glass onion comes to netflix tomorrow yo fuck Uh, yeah so last weekend for when this movie or for when this comes out but i got to see glass onion in theaters during the week it was in theaters and it's a great time nice i've heard so so much fun i've been so excited for it i'm i'm excited to watch it again um that's all i got all right that's all my goals to gab Uh, i want to watch i don't know if you all have seen literally like all the millions of tiktoks about it recently but uh speak no evil no no it's a it's a horror movie that came out this year that everybody's been fucking raving about oh um on tiktok and so I've been wanting to watch it. It looks pretty intense. So I haven't wanted to do it for like a movie night with me and Piper. Sure. Um, because I'm Ooh, not so sure, sure what like triggers it might hit. But people that I trust their opinions on have said it's like very, very, very good. So I'm probably I might watch that this weekend because I got nothing going on. Cool. Can't nice. wait to gab that ghoul. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to gab the, all over that ghoul. The poster looks almost identical to the It Follows poster. Yeah. I feel like I've seen a lot of posters that look an awful lot like the It Follows poster. Yo. The car turns sideways and then background. So, so I was just looking up to see when Skinamarink was hitting uh, streaming, and I see there is one singular viewing in town in January. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to see that. I think we better... I missed what do you call um, Terrifier two, so I'm not gonna miss Skinnerink. Um, yeah, the Huber's peop- voice. This is the sound of a man who's about to miss Skinnerink. No, you shouldn't yeah. because th- this movie got pirated to hell, and um, it did. I I know that it's very um, what's the word I'm looking for? Disheartening for the creators. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Back to Casual Obsession, the horror movie podcast where we talk about horror movies. I'm your host Noah, and with me is my host Emma. Hi. My host Jeff. Hello. My host Nina. Hey, hey. And my host Jack. Hi. Jack not here? 
I think Hello. they lost Jack. Okay. Well, you know <laughs> what? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll connect. Oh, hey, I, and... <laughs> I think I, I think I hear something. Axe chopping through door noises. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what that so might just, be. We'll get that in post. <laughs> in hindsight, I don't know why I said Jack and not Tony because, you know, yeah. like. Yeah, that's a lot easier. Oh, See, well. when you first said Jack, my brain thought Tony, which is why I did like the high pitched one. But then mm. I was like, wait, no, Jack is the dad. And then I tried to do a Jack Nicholson impression and it did not work. Yeah, that was a really funny noise that you made. Though, so I'll <laughs> give you that. I would say even two very funny noises. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But if you couldn't pick up this uh, from the title and what we were just saying today, we're talking about. The Shining from 1980. Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, not the miniseries The Shining that Stephen King likes. There's this a is, miniseries? It is not good, from what I understand, yeah. as are many things that Stephen King involves himself with. True, true. Um, yeah, Stephen I don't, King I don't know. Stephen King very famously <laughs> hates this movie and feels that it's a really, really bad uh, adaptation uh, of his book. The yeah. only I, reason I know that is because of Mike Flanagan's Tumblr See, post. When he uh, talks about the production of the movie. Extremely long Tumblr post he made. I think that we should definitely all uh, read it before we talk about Dr. Sleep. Um, but yeah. Uh, we really gotta troll good. this man's social media to find all the stuff about like Dr. Sleep Stephen that he's King. talked about. I mean, we might be able to just go to his Tumblr and ask him to guest on the podcast. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> With Don't the do that. I'll throw that his up. Tumblr is uh... crying, <laughs> screaming, throwing up, puking. Would not be able to handle it. Um, Neither would I. <laughs> <laughs> I'd play it cool, but I would shit myself. Yeah, just consist <laughs> constantly through the entire podcast. Oh just yeah, constantly shit. <laughs> real... Excuse me, Mike. <laughs> me. Excuse me, Mike. I need to empty my pan. <laughs> <laughs> i thought you were gonna um, say empty my pants and then you didn't and i was like what oh <laughs> nina you keep trying to talk i'm, I'm trying so sorry. to talk about stephen king right, uh, right, right. no stephen king doesn't like this movie um there's a lot of reasons why some of which flanagan did get to kind of resolve in dr sleep in a way that i think really brings together why the book ended the way that the book did because if the book didn't end the way that the book did then dr sleep wouldn't have ha would have happened the way that dr sleep happens in the in the movie like duology um because spoilers for the shining the book um at the end of the shining the book uh jack burns down the hotel to kind of stop it from hurting anyone the way that he hurt his family oh. um so in doctor sleep there is no overlook hotel for danny to go to so if you think about it in in the world where jack isn't able to burn down the overlook then of course danny's going to spend his whole spend his whole life haunted by that to the point where he would go back to it yeah so it's like Jack, it's almost like Jack succeeded in the books in a way that the movie Jack didn't. And mm -hmm. I like that a lot. And I think that's pro probably why King gave the go ahead to bring Kubrick's Overlook back for the Doctor Sleep movie because Flanagan knew how to wrap that story in a satisfying and meaningful way for both Jack and Danny. Mm hmm. Huh. Yeah. But I'm getting way ahead of us here. That's just yeah, we haven't cool. even talked about this overlook. Yeah, and I still oh. haven't seen Dr. Sleep. Let's overlook <laughs> onto that summary. Overlook? Right. <laughs> Looks like we overlooked the notion of doing the summary. Overlooked <laughs> the whole layout like we usually do. Oh. So here, here's a, here's a little quick spoiler-free intro to the movie, all right? Um, Jack Torrance is a writer. Uh, he says he just teaches on the side to make some money, which is honestly one of the funniest lines in the entire movie. Yeah. This man. Yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> just a way of making ends meet. <laughs> this man has picked up a job as uh, the winter caretaker of this mountain lodge, the Overlook Hotel. I don't know why I called it a lodge. It's a hotel. It's a big mountain resort hotel, the Overlook. For five months of the year, the winter is so bad that they basically just abandon ship and one guy lives there with his family, if uh, he has one, um, just taking care of the place while all the snow is there. You know, you heat rooms, you do minor repairs, you make sure that the building is standing 
by May when it's time to, uh, you know, pack up and uh, kick it off, you know? Mm -hmm. Jack has uh, one wife and one child. His wife, Wendy, played by Shelley Duvall. Jack, by the way, is Jack Torrance, played by Jack Nicholson. I don't know why I decided to give actor names in this, but there's only three main characters, so we may as well. And Danny something plays Danny Torrance. Danny I didn't actually look up him. Danny Lloyd plays Danny Torrance. Um, Danny, um, he has a little imaginary friend named Tony, a little guy. He talks through his finger and he lives in his mouth and he hides in his stomach when people look in his mouth to try and find him. All normal things. All it's normal. very normal. Very yeah. much kid stuff. Well, um... While Jack calls home to say that he's got the job and he's going to be home late, Danny has a bit of a... Um, a vision? I don't know. I was going to say a bit of an episode, a vision. Uh, he passes out is the main thing. And while they're at the doctor, Wendy describes Jack coming home drunk one night and giving, giving Danny a, a big old yank and dislocating his shoulder as being the first time that Tony was uh, noticed as the imaginary friend. So, you know, that's just some important, like, groundwork info. They end up all going to the Overlook together. Danny is not pleased about it because uh, his imaginary friend has told him that it's just not a place he wants to be. And also, Meanwhile, he really he, uh, wants to have friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly. Like, he's a kid. He needs friends. He can't just live in this hotel. Yeah. Uh, but he does make one friend at the hotel who promptly leaves, and that is Dick Halloran, played by Scatman Southers. Crothers. Crothers. My mistake. Scatman Crothers who also is able to uh, use what he calls the shining, which is, uh, you know, uh, speaking to each other with their minds and. It's telepathy. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a telepathy not... thing. There's like magic involved with it. Um, But yeah, they, they take the job and that's where I'm going to leave off on the description for the time being. I was about to say, this is a great spoiler summary, but. <laughs> I, mean, I feel there's, like there's, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. So it, before any of the, the big stuff yeah. happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. But anyway, um, while I'm talking, yeah. I'm not going to cede the floor to anyone. This is my oh, um, uh, filibuster, if you will. It's I'm going to keep talking shit. and bring in the critical reception oh. of this movie. Now, I know that there has to be um, an Ebert on this. Oh, there has to be. And I believe, okay, um, let's see, Ebert. Oh, oh, I'm excited to bring this one in. Oh, boy. Uh, but we're, we'll get to him last, as is tradition. I IMDb. Your Twitter friend Brandon was last. Oh, tw uh, Twitter Brandon. Okay, fine. Uh, it's Ebert, <laughs> then Twitter Brandon. It's it's order of importance. <laughs> of Twitter course, Brandon right, does right. rank at the top. Right, right, yeah. right. IMDb is an 8.4 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes is an 82%. Metacritic is a 66%. And Letterboxd is 4.3 out of 5, or 86% if uh, for everyone following. Um, Ebert gives this movie a 4 out of 4. Hey. Wow. Finally, good taste from Mr. Ebert. Is it because we brought in a, uh, a wildly talented set of actors? Maybe. Is it because it's good? Probably a uh, well-regarded director also <laughs> a well-regarded director a lot working just toward a, it. There's a lot that should make this movie good for him. And it did. Yeah. And that's what's important. But what's really interesting Ebert is that everyone Schmiebert. else, everyone else oh, is sorry. sitting around like the eight or nine point, And then there's like fucking Metacritic 66%. What is that? Yeah, no, that one actually what's threw me a lot. It? I'm, I'm confused as to why it's so low. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why it throws me a little bit. But yeah, um, Brandon time. Yeah. Twitter yeah. Brandon. What's Brandon say? I was so happy to find this tweet oh, because no. I was ready to be really mad at him. <laughs> I'm always ready to be mad at him. Twitter Brandon says, The Shining is one of the best movies ever made, full stop. Oh. But in all its greatness, Shelley Duvall's performance is almost always overlooked. It's one of the best performances in any film ever. Correct. Fuck Kubrick for putting her through hell, though. All, all correct statements. Holy shit. All that's correct. exactly the what I was correct. thinking the whole time watching it. Is God, she's, she's so incredible. amazing. It's and easy to get overshadowed by Jack Nicholson, but she's so good. She's so can good. Can I say, 
What's a that? fashion icon. Absolutely. Genuinely, Absolutely. I dress like her every day. I literally, uh, I waffle so much between, less skirts than her. Oh, sure. But mm-hmm. I waffle between her and Jack's sense of style pretty much constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, shit, you do. It's either the flannels. The- <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, she- but Shelley Duvall's acting, I don't think Jack Nicholson's would work without her. Honestly. Like, he's great, you know he's what? what everyone remembers, but like they... Like, he does not have the impact unless he's... Because the kid actor is great. He's good. Yeah, Danny Lloyd did amazing for being as old as he... Or young as he was. When Danny interacts with Jack, he's very monotone and he's a kid who's shut down, which is totally understandable. But when Wendy acts alongside Jack, I am heartbroken the entire time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say... That to be able to hold her own against Jack Nicholson in essentially a two and a half hour one on one performance, that by itself is really impressive. Incredible. You know? Absolutely like, incredible. Yeah. I don't know. I'm so thrilled with how well she did, which is before we get into our personal like rankings for this movie, because it was mentioned yeah, in Twitter, Brandon. Mentioned. Fuck you, Twitter, Brandon, for bringing this up too early. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of issues with the production of this movie. Yeah. Stanley Kubrick is well known as a guy who is an insane perfectionist. There's a, for context, a joke about how he faked the moon landing, which will be brought up at some point in this because people think that he hid the clues that he faked the moon landing in this movie. What? Um, you think? You mean me? <laughs> <laughs> honestly, the funniest thing is... He could have put it in just because he thought that the theory was funny. That's, that's uh, if he did it intentionally. My theory, personally. <laughs> but people have joked that he's such a perfectionist that to fake the moon landing, he would have made them go to the moon to fake the moon landing. Like that's one yeah. of the, in my opinion, funniest running jokes about him and the moon landing. Yeah. Um. But unfortunately, with being that kind of perfectionist, comes like take after take after take. That was fully unnecessary. Um, He wanted to create an environment to get the actors and actresses to do what he wanted, which included being really shitty to Scatman Crothers. Um, Being really shitty to uh, Shelley Duvall. Yeah, being really shitty to Shelley Duvall and being kind of chill with Jack. Yeah, he was kind of okay to... Da- he was good to Danny Lloyd because Danny Lloyd was a fucking child and he knew that. Mm-hmm. He was yeah. actually not good to Jack Nicholson on purpose. He was good to Jack Nicholson out of necessity because Jack Nicholson was shit to him right back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which and I will talk Jack. later about how he did that because it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> I mean, also, yeah. Jack... Nic- of the three... I mean, I don't know about Scatman, but Jack Nicholson even back then was like pretty huge he right? was a big name yeah no time, he was yeah. a big oh, yeah. get for this movie oh yeah i want to sure. say He's... he wasn't like as huge as we all know him to be now at that point but he was he was a very recognizable name oh he was by mm. no means a nobody no no not know? whatsoever but yeah um i what was it 500 some takes backing shelly duvall up the staircase with the bat uh like, i don't recall i'm talking like that one but i know in at least one of the shots where you see her backing up the staircase it's not jack mm-hmm. nicholson walking toward her it's actually stanley kubrick and what mm-hmm. you're seeing yeah, just hit him not, with the bat. is not her being in character pretending to be scared of jack torrance the character it's her not being in character being scared of real life stanley kubrick yeah jesus He's, yeah he wanted <laughs> He, I believe, said that in order to bring out the, like, attitude of someone who is being abused and isolated and scared, he, like, basically felt that he had to literally abuse her to get that. Because yeah. he couldn't mm-hmm. trust the actor to fucking act. Because yeah. he's yeah. a piece Toxic- of shit. Toxicity so. of method acting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's, I, I think forced, that, forced method acting. acting. Forced yeah. method acting. Like, method acting's bad on its own, and we've seen what it can do to actors in a right. lot of ways. Ugh. But to to force your actors to unwillingly method act something as cruel as isolation and uh, mm-hmm. emotional and mental abuse is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Instructing like staff to ignore her when she was talking to them, stuff like that. Oh, so 
This, Ugh, yeah, Jesus. It's, literally, it's really shitty. All the stuff that he did is like not good. But we also we can't devote a whole podcast to that because that's not that like no one wants to hear it, but it it's isn't really done. what we do and here. It's not and what we, we don't. Do. Yeah, um, we don't have. It's not the, like we haven't done the we, research. We yeah. don't have the knowledge. There yeah. are other resources out there that will um, do her more justice than we are going to be able to do in the time that we have. Yeah, mm-hmm. with the information that we have, we're on her side. And that's yes. that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and she's she's finally returning to acting. Yeah, just yes. as yes. this was like the last year, movie right? she acted in. Uh, that's not true. Um no. Didn't she oh. was in other Popeye stuff. After this? Yeah, she was in a handful of other things after this, but not okay. very much. And it's very yeah, she clear heavily that this toned movie, down. like the work on this movie affected her mental health very profoundly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and so I, she did I not return to her... the kind of level of acting that she was doing, I guess I should say. Yeah, I, yeah, um, I wasn't after expecting this film. her to ever come back in any capacity whatsoever. So the fact that she is no, back yeah. is like incredible, actually. Yeah. Surprise. better treat her right. Yeah. They better. Mm-hmm. I will hunt down anyone who the, doesn't. The good thing <laughs> is, I think there's a lot more accountability for stuff like that now you it, hope so at least I'll, just quick non sequitur then we'll get back into the program um <laughs> it reminds me of all the stories i've heard about clint eastwood's sets oh, no. which is no 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 everyone agrees that clint eastwood's sets are the best film sets to be on <sighs> oh thank at fuck. All. okay because the man, so many of that guy's movies and <laughs> he sticks to such a oh. tight shooting schedule and if they only have time for one take, fuck it, man. They're doing one take and they're done. That's why okay. in American Sniper, there's the very clearly fake baby doll because he just wasn't going to do that. The kid was crying and they didn't have time to fix it. So they brought in a baby doll to cover up real quick and keep moving on. OK, um, I actually didn't know so, he directed you know, that one. I don't know why I didn't know that. <laughs> Right, it does reek of of um, Eastwood once you think about absolutely, it. Absolutely, it's so does. comedically on brand. It makes perfect I've sense. But when I think of him, I'm always thinking of either cop movies or westerns. I've so, seen three or... Eastwood movies, and none of them are very well directed. But they're all like they ex- like ex- none of them are extremely well directed in any way. Yeah, that's sure. basically yeah. what everyone agrees is he's not the best director by any means, but he's been the best to work with, and they love working with him on set. So they would do it again in a heartbeat. That's because... the same thing people say about Rob Zombie, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that is actually yeah. Generally, yes. <laughs> that's the okay. kind of the ultimate crossover I want to have. The reputation I want to have, though, is guy who rates this movie really well, and I think I can do it. <laughs> well, Noah, what would you rate this movie? I, for me, not even a question. This is a 10 out of 10 movie. Oh, good. I thought I was going to have to fight you on this. Okay. This is a zero out of 10. Whoa. Zero being bad things and 10 being the good things. Zero bad, 10 good. <laughs> yeah, loop it around. Um, 10 good out of 10. Job. I love... Almost every single element of this movie. I love how much of a slow thing it is. I love just little things that these actors will do over the course of this movie. Like yeah. Jack sitting there slack jawed in his chair. Like, well, what do you want me to do at Wendy when Danny comes in with the choke marks on his neck? Oh, that's one of the more overt like, ones even actually. I've got so many yeah. little things written down. Oh, there's little. Gonna, yeah, there's actual little things. Absolutely ham on this shit. At some point in this for the episode, listeners at home, Jeff just pulled up a tome about 18 inches thick that just says The Shining Notes Part One. Yeah, <laughs> that's almost part two not is even bigger. a joke. <laughs> Actually, it's I have what I have is one single double sided page because this is the final page <gasps> of my podcast. The end notebook. of the book. Wow, well, it ended on so the, sad. Has the cardboard. That's so well, I the the. That's the back. The cover's blue. But... So Noah gave it a 10. No offense to Jeff's blue notebook. It's very no, cool. Yeah, yeah. But Noah That's gave his movie no a 10. 10. Fuck your notebook. Yeah. What did you give it, Nina? Oh, also a 10. Yeah. This movie is beautiful and well paced and sets kind of the groundwork for a lot of things that I do enjoy about other um horror in the same kind of genre like this movie and hill house are very similar in Mm -hmm. a lot of Mm -hmm. ways and a lot of obviously i don't love stephen king but mike flanagan loves stephen king and so i have to give him a little credit (laughs) um so that's such a mood 
<laughs> so overall, this movie, it's beautiful. The the styling, the sets, the the acting, just the way that it captures isolation and just the the character of the overlook itself. Ten out yeah. of ten. Jeff. Uh, I what am did also you think? giving it a 10 out of 10. Everything that this movie I'm is surprised. trying to do, it does perfectly. Uh, I'm going to rant about so many things, so I will be brief this time. It's a 10. <laughs> and Emma. So. Okay. You guys. Okay. I prepared <laughs> for this mentally. <laughs> um, There are a lot. No, it's just resting his head on his mic. Just give us the point. number. <laughs> Just don't, Just don't say there it. Are, there are so many things about this movie that are incredibly well done. Um, but Just hit us with the four. There, it's absolutely not a four. Okay. Oh, thank um, God. Why would I was be- so you made me so afraid. Oh, the, oh, please say it's not a two. This is a very solid movie. Um, and having so I watched it for the first time a few months ago, and then didn't enjoy it a whole lot. And then watch Doctor Sleep, and then rewatching it today, um, I enjoyed it a lot more. Uh. But I do have a pretty glaring problem with it that opened the door to more problems with it. Um, and so I'm gonna give it like a we're gonna split the difference between the two numbers I'm stuck with and give it a seven point eight. God. Okay. 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 No, scared you the shit out of forever. me. Oh, oh, you did you not guys... have to build up to that for so long. Jesus Christ, I was so worried. That's fine. You guys said it it's completely fine. That's all. Oh. I was I was so disappointed that, or I was so scared you guys would be so disappointed in me because you all gave it a ten. I mean, you yeah, know, I'm I a little, expect... but not like that Emma, disappointed. I never expect you to agree with me on how good movies are, especially older ones. So, like, yeah, this is <laughs> okay. I remember well, you said any movie released before you were born, you inherently don't care for. Yeah, and this is so for for an older movie, this is probably one of the best ones that I've seen. Um, <laughs> Alien as shaking compared... right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, as compared to like, um as a joke well not as a joke so i started watching the exorcist yesterday right yeah. as many of you probably saw me tweet out mm-hmm. um because i thought that was the movie we were supposed to cover and then nina was like hey you know that's not the movie we're covering right <laughs> yeah um and so i watched the first 30 minutes and that movie so far has a lot of the hallmarks that i hate with older movies uh, um and this mm-hmm. one is missing a lot of those and i'll go further into detail later this but, one does have the benefit um, of being 12 years more recent than the exorcist oh does it yeah the exorcist does came it? out in like okay, 1968 that's good to know. but what? really it's that old it's very i thought old. it was in the 70s it's 73 no, it's like late 60s it's 73 what nope it's 73 why do i think late 68? 73 where did that's i hear question. that December of 73. December 26, so that would have been a good Christmas movie. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the um, Catholic Church loves The Exorcist. As as a little teaser to um some thoughts I would love to talk about after the after the spoiler break. Um I actually think Jack Nicholson was a terrible choice for this role. Whoa, oh. no. Incorrect. And additionally, fuck he, you. He nails the end, and that's the only thing he nails. I, I think. Oh, okay. I strongly Fucking disagree. Wrong. Okay. Oh no. Man. And I we're, am, we're, we're I am gonna going to talk about that to you, after and this. I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> I am open to this, and I'm open to hearing why you think this. I am not open to this whatsoever. Jeff is having but I need to hear their why you um, think it. Texas Chainsaw moment. <laughs> I'm. Uh, <laughs> his early the, the earlier in the movie is like when some of his best stuff is. I thoroughly But the content disagree. warnings for this movie before we start right, to get yeah, into the debate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, we got massive domestic abuse. Immense. Yeah, we got mm-hmm. a lot of domestic abuse. We do be having the N-word with the hard R uh three times. Three times by two different characters. Um we have the really nasty leper lady. Yeah. Um I guess that's yeah. I don't know, is she's... it leper or is it just kind of? I think I thought it was just gross, she, like... decaying skin from being in the bath. Too yeah, long. that was that was how I read it. Just rotting. Yeah, I always not... 
read it well, as I've a corpse. Always, I don't remember from the book. I've always heard her referred to the other way, but it, it oh. doesn't really matter. It's the nasty bathtub lady. Yeah. Nasty yeah. bathtub lady. Um, uh, child, lots of child endangerment. Mm -hmm. Good bit. Child mm -hmm. endangerment. Yeah. Child Wrapped abuse. up nicely in the domestic abuse that we previously mentioned. Yeah. Child abuse yeah. for uh, sure. Um, that's kind lot of, of, yeah. A lot of when we say when we say abuse, we mean literally uh, like every facet of that emotional, yeah. mental, physical, um, a lot of a lot of that. And it's portrayed in a way that's not this is my favorite thing about this movie. It's not portrayed in the way that a lot of 2000s movies portray portray domestic abuse. Yeah. This is mm. realistic, like biting, scathing, almost made me cry watching it. Um, so. Yeah, don't expect like, ah, oh, but honey, you never let me write my book, slam store levels. It's Or like the, oh. just blatant shouting and whiskey bottle throwing or something. No. No. Though I, we are hinted at that that was the old system. Yeah, yeah that's true. There is yeah. talk of it. Uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's uh, that's that's all there. Also, maybe the worst crocheted tie I've ever seen in my life. You take don't, that. Don't read my notes. You take that don't back. Those That's not ties for are cool, and people no, should still wear you them. Can't, I'm not reading your notes. You said it at the beginning of the movie. I did see it in your notes and think to myself, "Damn, I remember that. That was horrific." So, Wait, which yes. big knit ties? Is it almonds or at, jacks? Almonds at the very okay, beginning. Yeah, almonds is like, way way worse. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's big. It's chunky. It's about eight inches wide. Yeah. It's red. Bad tie. It's not yeah. a good tie. <laughs> but um, that's all I have for content warnings. What do you? How do y'all feel? I think that's kind yeah. of it. Yeah, the usual gore as well. Yeah, in a couple I mean, scenes. Like it's mostly just like blood dripping yeah. or spattered mm -hmm. or dumping, it, as the case may be. Oh, there is an elevator full. There's of an blood. elevator full of blood. <laughs> There is that. There's an elevator full of blood. I love it. Uh, that elevator is my I favorite guess, character in the movie. It is kind of the whole point of the story. I we did forget the whole like isolation element of things. Um, so well, that was in the spoiler part. Well, I guess I, isolation is a spoiler. <laughs> yeah, I guess I didn't really it's think of that spoiler. as a thing to mention in the content warnings. Yeah, I just put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Emma. I'm going to interrupt you while you're taking a sip of your drink because that's the perfect time to address you. Uh. Yes. Jeez. <laughs> a little gift, a little gift. What for would the you editor. like, Noah? Thank you for interrupting my drink. Well, Emma, I got to be honest, that burp, pretty scary. But was it yeah. as scary as The Shining? Ooh, great question, Noah. Mm. Um, so, old movies, I feel. I feel like utterly desensitized to their horror tropes and like the horror methods that they try to pull off in their movies. Um, and I'm not sure if that's like a universal thing for people, but for me personally, um, it just wasn't very scary, but I know this is a movie that people have been very scared of in the past. And I think, um, issues of domestic abuse and child endangerment and various things like that. If you have direct experience with that, it can really hit at you. Um, so I, I'll give it like a, a three out of 10. Um, it's not the kind of movie that's going to like jump out at you and scare you a bunch, but there are some very real themes that I think might, might strike you if they directly impact your life. It's more one of those one things that's going to sit with you more than jump at you. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. about to say. It's a yeah. movie that sticks with you afterward more so than it scares you in the moment. Absolutely. But Noah, now that we've now that we've done that, can you tell us a little bit more about what happens in this movie? Oh yeah. So after um, after everyone uh, abandons the Overlook and it's just the Torrance family. You see that um, Jack's just kind of settled into this like lazing about routine. He's not really doing a lot. Um, he sleeps until almost noon one day. Until he is greeted with breakfast in bed after like it kind of looks like Wendy has gotten everything like going already. Danny's just running around giving us an idea. Of the scale of some of this place like this hotel is 
huge. Yeah, the the early scenes just, where we get like Ullman showing Jack around and then showing Jack and Wendy around. We get those like really mm-hmm. long panning, like side scrolling shots, just showing how huge yeah, just, some of these rooms are, how long some mm-hmm. of the hallways are. And then we also get more shots now of Danny, like what riding his tricycle. Yeah, riding his tricycle just through like the main foyer, the kitchen, and a couple of hallways. Yeah. Um, but you see that, you know, the, everything's just kind of like here and the weather's not bad yet and everything's kind of fine. Unfortunately, the, um, as the reports for bad weather comes in, you see that Jack has been having some writer's block, which he is clearly, um, not taking well with all this isolation. It's clearly not giving him the inspiration that he was really hoping to receive to write his book. As the snow starts to roll in, Jack gets more and more angry and uh, volatile with his family, snapping at Wendy for just coming in and saying hello one day. And basically, she just came in and was like, hey, what do you want to do tonight? Uh, What would you like to eat kind of attitude? And he's like, if you ever see me in this room, then don't fucking speak to me, you stupid, stupid person. Um, You know, um, just... Uh, uh, one of the more uncomfortable scenes as he's delivering this little like monologue at her about it uh for me at least really? and she's just standing there saying yes yeah. dear sorry dear the whole time she's but in a way it. better way than i just delivered that she is she is doing yeah. her best to just uh, the communication between this couple is not as bad as you would expect it to be honestly because you know they're both not great at it she'll say things that it doesn't like give him a moment to respond or um and he'll just be sat there saying like oh all right or the other way around where he'll just unload on her and the whole time she'll just be going okay all right okay um but that makes it like they're talking to each other it's not like they're hiding things from each other for the most part um and that makes it worse (laughs) Yeah, and if you watch all the little subtle clues, it's so obvious that she's afraid of him in every scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a few scenes in the uh, in the opening when they're giving the tour around the place where she'll say something and then just kind of like look over at him like, uh, yeah, is th- that's OK. And he's and he's there in smarmy uh, formal business mode saying, yeah. well, that'll be just swell. And it's like she doesn't know if he is saying that just for the, the company present yeah. or if he's actually approving of things, because we see without her there that he is very much willing to put on the charm and say things that are blatantly untrue. Like when they ask if Wendy's OK with ghosts around yeah. or like deaths and he's like oh yeah she's totally into that shit yeah. it's like jack <laughs> or my favorite is when allman shows them like their little room their little set of rooms i suppose in mm-hmm. the you know whatever corner they're tucked away in and it's this you know tiny little spot in this giant ass hotel that they could have any room in and as yeah, they look around real it, servant quarters kind of yeah, spot as they look around it if you look at her face she doesn't say anything in this scene but she is so obviously and visibly disappointed by the room but the whole mm-hmm. time jack is just like perfect for a child it's cozy it's great for a family and she Holy. just doesn't say anything because mm-hmm. it's a bad room it's man. not good it's not a good room is and really that's just one of very to... tiny little like subtle things that she does early on in the movie, like that kind of thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, it's so good. Anyway, we were talking about yeah the, the um, yeah the snow that we were promised finally rolls in around the same time that Danny sees um some ghosts, the Grady twins, the murdered children of the old caretaker. Uh, we were told about him a little bit earlier, but he, you know, they were locked up and he killed his wife and kids and then uh, himself as well. Yep. Um, which they attributed to the isolation of the whole thing and that he just couldn't hack it. But it's only happened kind of thing the one like time. That. Only the one time. Well, <laughs> until this time. But you know how it is. Uh, Jack is also starting to see ghosts after another fight with Wendy where she thinks that he uh, hurt Danny when he was hurt by one of the ghosts in the hotel. Um, he goes to one of the big party rooms, uh, the giant 300 person party hall that, uh, they had been touring through earlier. The gold room. goes to the empty bar because it was, it is important to note all the alcohol is removed from the premises, uh, when they leave because it lowers their, uh, insurance. Hmm. Um, 
But not now. Now Lloyd the bartender is there with a fully stocked bar, and he is happy to give Jack his first drink in, oh, what was it? Five months? No, 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 no. The timeline (laughs) is longer than that, in fact. And then if we if we go by when what we were told Danny three years ago. Three years ago, he swore off and said he'd never touch a drop. And Wendy says, well, he said that was true, but that was three years ago. And he's only been sober five months, except they've been at the hotel. For a couple and when of months. He, and then month. he says five mm-hmm. months. Yeah. So, yeah, so, it's, so clearly. Is this a writing error? I, due to the process I've heard about this movie, I do not think so. We, Any other movie I would think, oh, this was a scripting error. I think error. <laughs> it's just really accurate to both women who are trapped in abusive relationships um, and the excuses they make for their partners and also recovering addicts and the um, truths and lies they tell to different parties about how long they've been sober due to different like guilts associated with backsliding and stuff. Yes. Um, also, I was what I was just going to say is just in the the scene where Wendy is talking to the doctor, she is so obviously trying her hardest to cover Jack's she ass. She's trying so hard to yeah, cover Jack's I'm ass, gonna and talk, it is not I'm going to talk more about that scene later, so we'll come mm-hmm. back to it. But <laughs> Very excited to talk about that. Uh, let's see. Jack and uh, Lloyd. Jack gets drunk. Well, he has a couple of drinks. Okay, Jack has a couple of drinks, and his entire demeanor has shifted at this point from being a, like, trying to put on a smile abusive shitbag to open contempt. Yeah. Uh, We've gotten a couple of glimpses of how he really clearly does not care for his family, Uh, but this is the first time we've seen, like, real open contempt from him, uh, where he is told what room the ghost was in because... Uh, Wendy thought it was Jack, but then she's like, okay, Danny says it was another woman who is here. She is frantic because there's someone in the hotel with them. Jack goes to the hotel room, finds the naked lady in the tub. Uh, She comes up to him in the longest tit shot we have had on the podcast to date. You say tit shot as though that's the only thing in the shot. (laughs) Okay, yeah, it's full body nudity. It is full yeah. frontal body. nudity. Very the long longest shot. nude shot that we have had on the podcast to date, or maybe will ever. It was really long. Potentially. Mm-hmm. And um, he's excited. He's in. Oh, it. he's thrilled about this. And he comes up, he gives her a kiss and a hug, and then he catches a look at her in the mirror. Nope, Surprise. she's not a pretty naked lady. She's a nasty naked <laughs> lady. She's all falling apart and gross and rotting and really gross and he's and laughing. appalled at this he's like yo she's laughing she at him she's funny. laughing at him she, yeah she got him <laughs> and uh he runs out closes the door goes back to his little apartment and with so much contempt in his voice tells wendy there's no one in this hotel after this he goes off on a little walk around uh where he takes out their uh, little radio that Scatman has been trying to contact them on. He contacted the local police and he's like, hey, haven't heard from them. Could you make sure they're okay? And, you know, Jack finally just disables the radio, takes the fuses out. And uh, as we will see later, he also cut some element out of the snowcat that they could use to drive over the snow. After this, um, he goes back and has another drink where he ends up meeting the ghost of the other old groundskeeper, uh, Grady, who um, insists that he was never the groundskeeper. But then after a little bit of conversation, he's like, but if I was, I'd have to put my family in line. You understand how it is. Sometimes you just have to put them in their place I to do your job. I corrected them. I corrected them. As he said, um, And he makes it very clear that Jack is also to correct his family. At this time, we have Wendy walk into the room and see that, you know, Jack hasn't been writing a book all these months. He has just been writing in a variety of formats. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, which fun trivia. Kubrick's uh, secretary typed up a couple hundred pages of this so they could type so they could just like swish through all of them um you know we didn't have printers back then it was uh yeah they, well i mean we did somebody, have printers but not like that actually type that <laughs> and also since this movie was released in multiple languages they wrote out equivalent phrases 
in every language that it was released in. Mm-hmm. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's kind of cool. Jack comes in and he and Wendy have a a confrontation in which she ends up hitting him with a bat after he threatens her. And she locks him up in dry storage. Um, Danny has not been doing well this whole time. Ever since he got attacked, he's been kind of like closed off to the world. And it's all been Tony talking since then. Uh, Tony is the one talking to thank you, Mrs. Torrance and all that kind of stuff. Danny's just kind of asleep right now. But he makes sure to wake his mom up uh, by just screaming red rum after he writes it on the... uh, on the door, which if you look in the mirror, you can see it says murder. <laughs> Just in time for the ghost to unlock Jack Nicholson uh, so he can come up with an axe. Um, I'm going to fast forward this a little bit because it's, it doesn't tell well. You know, he chases him with an axe, chases him through the room, delivers the iconic. Here's Johnny line, gets his hand cut. Um, Scatman came back to make sure everything was OK immediately is killed with an axe and um then jack chases danny off into the maze but danny's real smart doubled back on his tracks and hid and jack gets lost in the maze danny reunites with a wendy who is scared shitless from running through the hotel and seeing all the ghosts because the hotel is fully awake at this point and just having a good old time with it uh luckily since scatman came up in his own uh snow vehicle they're able to hop into that and run away. Uh, and Jack is left there frozen in the maze. There's a maze. There's, there's a maze. There's a, yeah, there's I, a hedge maze. Maze. It's it, the, the hotel is fucking Oh, actually, mm-hmm. actually, it's not a maze. It's a labyrinth. Oh, I'm sorry. It is a labyrinth. Because a, a maze has a path through from like one side to the other. A labyrinth has a path that leads from the outside to the center. Okay, but Almond said our famous hedge maze. Well, Almond's an idiot who wears stupid ties. Almond he lies is. about an awful lot of things. So Almond's like, forgive me for no, not taking have, his judgment. Almond's like, you have you have issues with death. Well, there was a single accident that happened one time in the seventies, and that's the only time that anything bad has ever happened here. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff like that in this movie. That's it. That's that's the movie, though. Um, it's very the whole thing. I cannot state enough that I did not convey the um, isolation element of this enough. The, 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 the movie, movie does a great well. job with it. It's there's so much. No, it it does does there's so well. much visual storytelling. Yeah, there's the cue cards themselves that kind of pop up that um, tell us the passage of time. tell us the passage of time. And it goes it, it does this really well by showing us by going from a large amount of time of like a month to going down to days yeah, down to of days, the week to going down, down to hours, to hours yeah. and minutes. And it's like, I love that so much. There's the, the way that, um, like characters appearances change or, um, obviously the snow and everything, but my favorite's the chase scene in the maze and how Jack, um, how, <laughs> How cutting between Jack and Danny um, and like everything Wendy's going through prolongs that chase scene without making it boring. Yeah. Um, And just you feel like they've been in there forever. And Jack's like mental state is deteriorating so fast and he can hardly string a sentence together anymore. It's so, so so cool. And also like throughout Um, the movie, there are all these like really chaotic musical buildups that kind of just all come to nothing Mm -hmm. all the way up until the end of the movie when the crazy stuff starts actually happening. And I, I fucking love that. Yeah. I know that's something I talked about briefly when we covered the wailing. It kind of does the same thing where it builds very slowly by like having these moments where it builds up a lot and then like nothing happens. So you still have all that tension inside you for the next time that tension is building up. You're like already on Mm -hmm. edge still like, oh, when is the thing going to happen? And then it like it builds up and it doesn't happen that time either. And you're still just waiting for the thing to happen. It's so good. 
But it doesn't do the thing that I hate with um, similar stories that are more modernly told, Mm. which is that nothing is happening. And in fact, you're stupid for thinking something is going to happen. Ha ha. It was just a ball rolling down the hallway. We see from the very beginning that there is genuine danger in this hotel and everyone knows there's genuine danger in this hotel. No one has a good feeling about it. We get... Uh, the Grady twins, we get the blood elevator, we get a lot of stuff right out the gate, and they're just premonitions, but we're, like, shown things. We're not, like, we're, we're held in suspense, but we're not, like, kind of teased, yeah. you know? It, it feels like we're being shown hints of something further to come and not being told oh my kid just sleepwalks (laughs) like when wendy might say stuff like that she doesn't genuinely believe it versus in sinister yeah they genuinely are just like oh my kid just sleepwalks and i'm like ah cool very great i love this movie (laughs) also with like all the all the build-ups to nothing and stuff lots of times in more recent movies or actually even in movies of the time that were just not made quite as well as this one Lots of times when you when people try to do that build up to nothing thing, they'll give you a cheap jump scare that doesn't actually affect the plot. It's just like, you know, Mm -hmm. somebody's friend falling out of a closet to scare them on purpose. Ha ha ha. Wasn't that so funny kind of a thing. And you Mm -hmm. actually have the jump scare. So you do actually have some amount of release to the tension. Whereas with this, it builds up and then it just like cuts. It just stops. Nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. You weren't scared by anything. You didn't jump you just got blue balled that's it even like... the, even the tension isn't like when the release of the tension comes it's not a jump scare because we are never like because all three of the torrances are main characters whose perspectives we see um yeah. separated from everyone else's it's never like we're only following one person and the moment they walk out of like eye shot of something else you hear a spooky noise or anything we know jack has the axe and he's coming for windy it, there's no jump scare where he starts like hitting the door we've known he's coming yeah. this whole time we it's knew not it was it's not yeah yeah there's it's no not surprise it's not cheap yeah. Everything that the, the it, movie does, it does slowly. I fucking love that. And I love that. it. I love that. And it does it artfully. And I'm a big fan of when people like kind of put artistry into into things and not in like a way that's tr- I don't know, trying too hard. It's just consistent. Yeah. And I know you like it feels like a like uh Suspiria kind of stuff where it's oh, like the, the colors and the the shot composition and the like ge- geometry specifically oh, totally, yeah. of the design of the overlook yeah. where the, like, the, the carpet and the bathroom and the, I could go on forever. So I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah. What is this? A movie review podcast or something? <laughs> not for me. I have thanks. a question. Yeah, let's go. So obviously there is a very popular carpet pattern from The Shining yeah. that is referenced like everywhere. Yeah, it's the like orange um, hexagon one, right? Yeah. Yes. Why is there any reason that took off? But there's also a very distinct pattern for what was it, the gold room or whatever? Okay. Or yeah. I was the, curious, the like, inside, uh, is there any thirty seven as well, where it's like the blue like yeah. waves and stuff? I'm really yeah. curious about that because I had the same thought with the Here's Johnny line. Why is that the big one? There are so many things that he says that right. are so much more punchy. So many, in that and scene Here's even. Johnny is yeah. the one that's stuck. Even in that same scene. I totally scene, feel that. When Emma. he first walks in and he says, Wendy, I'm home. And he's like really casual. Yeah. That's such a good line. I loved that. I was like, that's so, especially with like him as a character that makes so much more yeah, sense because it's like even if it, he didn't have an axe in his hand that's scary for her to hear yeah and then he does have the axe yes. in his hand and we know it's worse than it would have been normally like and then the hallway like the hallway is really cool but yeah the other the other designs of the other carpets are in more like notable locations like very much so yeah so yeah that's it i just i don't know pop culture is weird yeah it's just the one that everyone's stuck okay. to i guess yeah, I was just curious if there was any like background knowledge that you all were aware of. Uh, maybe it's just that people like hexagons. True, could be. I do be liking hexagons. I See? think it kind of cap. <laughs> I don't know because I don't remember the gold rooms um, carpet, but I think it kind of captures the overall like colors that we see repeated in the majority of the overlook. When it comes to the reds and oranges yeah. and warm tones, it's more I think warm that's... tones than it is anything else. Yeah. 
Yeah, because we sense. see that with the the elevator doors and kind of the colors in the main. Yeah, there's room so that many Jack doors that are in. blood red in this building. I love yeah. it. There's so many red. Doors. I love how every time the the elevator doors are present, they've got this like black and red framing around them, and and then the doors, like you said, they are just straight red, and it looks out of mm-hmm. place in every single room of the hotel that we ever see them in. Mm-hmm. But it's mm-hmm. beautiful. It is. I it love looks it. so good. Um, I want to paint my doors red. And it kind of seems I like also... they use the cool tones for the situations where the most danger is, because that's what you get inside room mm-hmm. 237, where it's all these like light greens and blues. And mm-hmm. that's the color that it is in the hallway right outside of uh, Jack's bedroom. I love immediately how much grimier the hallways are the closer you get to where they live versus like that's so good. Yeah, they I get love like that, narrower. That's... They get cheaper looking. It's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can tell that the uh, the caretaker's room is part of the servant wing. Yeah, that is you all live here. But they That's don't all. they don't use that for the horror. You know, they yeah. don't use mm-hmm. the easy like, oh, these ha- hallways are narrower and more decrepit. So we're going to stick all of our ghosts here. Most mm-hmm. of if like, anything, they use the biggest. Room that's what I was going to say. The biggest, mm-hmm. widest, because that kind the of heightens room, yeah. those like feelings of like isolation, mm-hmm. especially since Jack has been isolated for so long to see him working alone in that giant room. First of all, as a writer, I'm never working in a room where I've got that much open, empty space around me. I mean, maybe that's just me they do say high ceilings are good for creative work high ceilings are one probably way too yeah, this is absurd. <laughs> you're right emma what's that I, I it would be very distracting mm. i I'd, I'd lose it perhaps uh jack does also lose he does it, but... he does famously lose <laughs> it <laughs> fairness, <laughs> but I was... fairness your honor <laughs> i was gonna say that contrast of him alone in that giant empty room and then the party scene mm. um where he's in a big room again in the in one of the biggest rooms of the hotel but he's like surrounded by people yeah. i don't know it's so good <laughs> big fan it's real yeah. nice there's a lot of like visual aspects that so much thought went into but they aren't like because i feel like a a lot of times in media if you put thought into something you want people to notice it so Mm. somehow you get a character to be like oh these hallways are getting pretty like slender or something yeah yeah um it's that's a modern cinema thing for sure as well Yeah, it seems like kubrick either didn't mind the idea of people missing things or had faith that his audience would see the things he wanted them to see I trust I will say, my audience. Whether or not he trusted his audience, um, a lot of modern movies are made for people who watch half of it while looking at their phone. That's true. It's true. And this isn't meant as I a dig against anyone here. When I say that, I it's do meant it as too. A dig. The fact that, <laughs> <laughs> but like, no, yeah. a lot of modern movies definitely work around um, yeah. knowing people aren't watching all the time. Whereas Kubrick was like, "If you're not I watching my movie, your undivided it's... attention, <laughs> and that mm-hmm. is that." <laughs> Yeah. But, but it does it in a way that like I I don't know. We watch we no and I watch a lot of James Bond movies. Mm, yeah. Um and oftentimes in old movies, especially when there's well this movie doesn't have as much plot, but it still really does like the symbolism <laughs> embarrassing when you don't have as much plot as a James Bond movie. <laughs> Well, the thing is, James Bond movies really, the old ones really depend on you to um, be watching Mm. the whole time that nothing is happening on the off chance that something will happen that is crucial to the plot that is happening. Yeah, you got the visual cueing. Yeah. And then there's like a man in the background while Bond is just like (laughs) sitting balls out in the sun. He's just like, I'm having a wonderful day. But sunglasses guy is there. You can't forget that. Yeah. So um, this movie, I think, does a really good job of um, kind of expecting you to pay attention, which but without... um, it, I, I it don't know. It's just the to. pacing and the storytelling, and it's like it, the the like the the subtleties aren't just in the visuals; they're also in the dialogue mm-hmm. and the way that the characters talk to each other. Yeah. Um, because you were talking about uh, Wendy and how she seems subtly scared of Jack, and um, my favorite example, yeah. honestly, well, not my favorite, but one of my favorite examples is Lloyd. Uh, Lloyd the bartender. <laughs> I, 
adore. Who was that actor you name dropped earlier? Because that's the guy who could play Lloyd in the modern era if we ever had to redo this movie Richard for Brake? some godforsaken oh. reason. Richard Brake. You know what? Yeah. Yeah. I'm he in for that. I'm yeah. For that's that. Lloyd. Lloyd, Lloyd has I puzzled the... over Lloyd so hard my last watch through I of this movie. Lloyd. I love his skeletal face. I love how he wooden looks like a he corpse. Is. I love it's the customer. I told Noah this. It's the customer service face. Oh, it absolutely he is. He is the strongest customer service presence ever. He takes everything that Jack says. I wish I could do what he does. He takes everything that Jack says in stride and plays off of it in a way that is very like contained and polite yeah. while also <laughs> encouraging him to take a step further. Yeah. Women can't live with them. Can't live without them. I love Literally, what I love especially yeah. is like this massive contrast of the way that when Jack is talking to Lloyd, he becomes all like animated in a way that he mm -hmm. is not when talking to anyone else. He does this with Grady as well, but it's in a similar context. He's super like animated and almost like jovial with him at moments. And he opens up to him with like no reservations whatsoever meanwhile lloyd is like a fucking telephone pole he's just standing there so, staring back at him wooden like he's not giving so, him anything um so i think this is this is my observation of jack as a character okay uh in the in the mo movie jack jack's entire personality revolves around his power dynamics with other people oh okay um Everything that he does kind of revolves around what the other person can do to him. And Lloyd can do nothing to him except ask him for money. So the only time that we see him like even kind of falter in these interactions is when he's talking about paying for the drinks. Other than that, it's that's something that as a customer service worker, I feel constantly is people don't treat me the same way that they treat they would treat anyone else it's like mm -hmm. you they know that you can't do anything to them um and versus how he talks to his boss and how he's willing to he's animated in a very different, a different very way, much yeah. more withdrawn way he would never make the jokes that he makes to lloyd to ullman never he's got power over windy but he doesn't he doesn't take joy in that power the no. way that he does in his p dynamics with lloyd and he has power over danny but danny has power over him because danny is a kid it's you don't think of that but he when he gets hurt everyone looks at everyone jack like the monster he it, is yeah. and also everyone sees him for who he really is so in a way danny has the most power over okay him. i don't know okay, i think, so hold I on. think so that's you can really interesting that in the actual characters that we see him interact with like wendy danny and ullman but then in the illusions that the hotel shows him what does it choose to show him to get the reaction that it wants out of him it shows him people who are either in subservient roles like lloyd or grady or the most vulnerable possible thing he could possibly look at a naked woman in a bathtub. Mm -hmm. It shows him thing, yeah. like things and people that have absolutely no power over him whatsoever in his perception. That's a really cool mm -hmm. read. Yeah. That's, that is my opinion on, um, that's, that's my whole read on Jack. My read of a lot of what's going on with Jack is, uh, tied into my read of what's going on with the hotel. So perhaps I shouldn't get into that right at this moment. Uh, can I ask a Jack related question? Yeah, let's go. Mm -hmm. And this this ties back to a question I often ask relating to older movies. How was the audience supposed to feel about Jack for a large portion of the movie? Because like the this is eighties. Uh, it's I don't think he was ever meant so... to be seen as a good yeah, guy. I don't, I don't think you're supposed to like. But him. like that's peak. That's peak. Like wife bad kind of no, like I, I don't think that's the way this here's, is intended i don't think you're ever supposed here's the to. thing that we live in an era where people look back at these movies and read them as as like kind of trying to portray these people like people like jack um in a light where you know they're more um sympathetic mm -hmm. but the biggest criticism that king i believe if i'm i might be wrong but a lot of other people have had that they have like read into why King doesn't like this movie is that King thinks that Jack in this movie is too unsympathetic from the very beginning, mm. because in the book, 
Jack has a lot more he has a there's a more good to him in the beginning and there and he has a chance to redeem himself in the end. And Kubrick mm-hmm. fully removed that from this version of Jack. Um yeah. And I don't think that this movie is devoid of subtlety in the way that, like, a lot of movies in, like, the wife bad era, which I think gets stronger when you look at, like, movies that are comedies and family oh, movies totally. that are, like, Christmas movies. Absolutely, yeah. Like, I, those are completely devoid of subtlety, but that's something that, that lives on today in modern comedies is the misogyny is still more present in those when you have movies like Barbarian that are fully about misogyny mm-hmm. and then you can hold that up next to comedies that yeah. still have so much in it. I think that's true with this movie, too, especially when we look at how Wendy acts early on and how she talks to the other woman at the very beginning in Danny's like doctor yeah, and how she is so careful about how she describes Jack. But I don't think that we as the audience are supposed to take Wendy at her word or we're supposed to Mm. accept that. Uh... So I'm looking up why Stephen King didn't like this movie because I figured this could be uh, very topical and helpful. He hates Jack Nicholson. So Emma... Um, well, no, no, it's not just that (laughs) Stephen King believes that Jack Torrance is a good man who is just bent one way or another. So in King's movie, he wants Jack to be seen as the good guy who is pushed. Whereas Kubrick, um, did not see that. Yeah, this size precise. It's worth mentioning. This is an extremely, by all accounts, this is an extremely loose adaptation of the book. It's really better described as Stanley Kubrick's The Shining than Stephen King's The Shining. Because it's kind Mm -hmm. of like Stanley Kubrick read the book and it gave him ideas and that's what this movie is. It's the idea that he got after reading The Shining. It's not really an adaptation per se. I mean, it has, it keeps mostly the same arc. It keeps all the same characters uh, for the most part. The big events, the the Shining, Tony, the room, basically everything. It just changes a bunch of other stuff. Um, But Um, Emma, I'm sorry. One of the things that I remember from our friend Mikey Flanagan's post yeah. mm-hmm. um, was that The Shining mm-hmm. and Dr. Sleep are both books about um, alcohol addiction and recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, I mean, that definitely influenced how I watched the movie this time and especially how I viewed Jack's character. But, um, I can totally understand Steven being frustrated mm-hmm. about oh, yeah. how Jack's character, because like Stephen King hat was addicted to, yeah, alcohol. he put a lot of himself yeah. into um, those kinds of characters. And, yeah. And to see yeah. how that was interpreted so, as to have an like a very personal journey in a book, um, be completely like stripped away. Yeah. Um, I, I can understand his frustration. Sure. There. Yeah, well, and then um, to see, I think what's, I cannot wait to talk about Dr. Sleep, and I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm not going to. In Aww. this movie, in this movie specifically, we already begin to see things that we do see expanded on more in Dr. Sleep of the similarities mm-hmm. between Danny and Jack. They're both people, even as a child, I like, I can see these similarities. Danny and Jack both get bored very easily Mm. and kind of fuck around with the environment as a result. Danny goes around exploring. Jack's literally bouncing a ball off the walls and going around and exploring as well. There's the fact that um, this is book confirmed, but this is also, uh, like, I think evident in the text of the movie. They both have The Shining. Jack wasn't ever able to explore that in his youth, and I think that kind of shows up in how he's also emotionally kind of, like, fucked up. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's, and, but it's pretty, it's pretty obvious. Um, and I think that's also part of why the hotel latched onto him is like, here comes a guy who's emotionally like closed off and has family and also has the shining. Here we go. I also like that in regards to both of them having the shining kind of looking at how Danny was warned Mm. that like you got to be careful with the hotel um and jack was not and how that kind of affects mm-hmm. how they approach the hotel mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but he was because jack just poured all of his well he he, he was, was warned. he was warned by allman they were both warned and they both have imaginary friends but one but of them didn't know to about warning, the one shining of them didn't. one of them has a good imaginary friend the other has evil imaginary friends okay yeah that's valid 
And I think the difference is also where those imaginary friends are coming from. Yeah. Um, because uh, book time again. Yeah. Book spoilers. Book spoilers. <laughs> big um, book spoiler, big, actually. Big like book spoilers. Big um, Tony is Danny from the future. Yeah. Um, warning him not to go to the hotel. And everything that Jack interacts with about the hotel is hotel provided. So um, they're, oh. they are kind of led in different directions from the very start yeah. um, by different energies. So it's really, it really sucks. Dan- Jack was set up for failure. And in the mm. book um, and, and looking at where Danny ends up, um, it's like you can see why not being given. I think this says something interesting about generation, like recovering from addiction oh, yeah. and generational like uh, trauma is not being given the tools to not being given the support that Danny got. And Danny didn't do very well with it either, partially because of the abuse from his dad and the cycle of abuse. But Jack never had the tools or the support to deal with the shining. Mm. And. That's a big thing to have to deal it's with. A lot. Jack it's Danny big. had yeah. some level of it and he still doesn't handle it very well and turns to to substances in the future and so does Jack. Mm-hmm. And of Jack, of course it would happen to Jack worse, which is why like again kind of in order to give Danny sympathy, I think we also have to give Jack a little bit of sympathy, which is hard to do cuz he sucks. Yeah. Um can I ask a book question oh, okay i might not have an answer because it's been a long time since i read it but yes i i think you will um i think one of the most confusing aspects for people about this movie is the end of jack being in the picture mm. at the end does that happen in the book no because in the book jack burns down the hotel yeah True. that's a this is a kubrick invention um, you'll notice that in the picture, his hand is in the up down Baphomet pose, uh, meant to symbolize that Jack Torrance is the devil. <laughs> oh God. Just Wait, is that well, real? I mean, cause like that's the, yes. the pose in from like the, the devil tarot card and stuff and from, from the Baphomet. Yeah. But I don't mm-hmm. think it's supposed to yeah. indicate that Jack is the devil, just that he's like evil maybe. And the as above, so below thing is maybe to hint toward like a reincarnation cycle or something. Because there's a lot of stuff talking about how he's always been here yeah. kind of stuff. There's it's it's the kind of like hyper mystical shit that bogs down all Stephen King properties. And it is hilarious <laughs> to me. This time it wasn't Stephen King. Yeah, the, one yeah, time. It's the same <laughs> shit that I have issues with in like it. Yeah. But this yeah. time it was actually. um Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> no, because Stephen King's issue in The Shining is that he wants The Shining to be a superpower and he wants to actually be writing the X-Men. Oh. Um. <laughs> That's not as cool but as But don't this. forget and the Indian burial that. ground. Oh. We, we cannot forget. I thought that was also a Kubrick thing, actually. Ace in the hole. It, oh, was it? I've honestly... I didn't even doubt for a second that it was a Stephen King yeah. thing because it's classic I don't King. Remember. <laughs> okay, so actually you saying... Jack is the devil actually leads me back to um, I actually heard a theory that Ullman is the devil in this movie and that him talking to Jack is like him like welcoming him to hell basically getting him to sign a deal yeah Mm. yeah oh not present in the book uh yes the burial ground is a movie edition oh my god this is so funny the The things that everyone thinks of as the most Stephen King things (laughs) Stephen King has no right to not like this movie because it's so him. No, he has but so his, much. But not the way he okay, likes yes, it. but his criticism is that this is a gorgeous Cadillac with no engine inside. It's a movie with no soul and no purpose that's at all. That's completely that's a bad, incorrect. That's a dumb it did, thing to say. but I understand where he's coming from because to him, it took the whole soul of the story out of it. Well, yeah, his. Well, yeah. For him, I don't the, like Stevo, but I'll give it to for him. him. The only story being told in The Shining was not Danny. Danny was the side character of the Jack Torrance tragedy that he wanted to tell he wanted to tell the tragedy of someone Danny giving was in the new mutants to to fucking uh jack <laughs> torrance's logan oh no that analogy <laughs> does not work but i'll let you it have it it works so well um no i like i think that it's interesting because there's a lot of stories like this where where one version of it focuses on one character and their downfall and being sympathetic to them 
and another mm-hmm. version will focus on another. And to me, this story isn't necessarily Danny's story either. We talked about it earlier on. To me, this story is kind of obviously it's all three of theirs. Yeah. To me, the story is Wendy's. Mm. The, to me, this is Wendy watching her son in danger and her husband being dangerous. I could totally see that. Um, and she's the yeah. only one who doesn't have the shining, and she so she's the only one who doesn't know what's going on until the end of the very the very end of the story. So by like yeah. traditional like storytelling like aspects, it is her story. I could see that totally. Yeah. But I don't know. That's just my interpretation, which is really ironic given her treatment on set that this is a story of a woman <sighs> who's like, yeah, like we're supposed to be sympathetic to her going through this stuff. And Jack's evil, evil, bad guy, 100 percent because he's abusing her. Kubrick, do you want to like maybe watch The Shining and <laughs> see if that like <laughs> it holds a mirror up in any way to your society? Stanley Kubrick watching The Shining. This is the best piece of cinema ever created. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Look how hard the uh, Director must have worked on this. <laughs> Jesus. Um, hey, this gives me I an would idea like to for ask a movie. Emma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna call it The Shining. Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, I would like to ask you though. You said yeah. the um to to all of us apparently wildly hot take I of think it was Jack hot. Nicholson. <laughs> Shut up. I knew this would be a hot take, honestly. <laughs> uh, that Jack Nicholson is a terrible pick for the movie up until the end. Uh, I would yeah. love to hear um, why you think that. Thank you for asking. I was wondering when this would, this would come up. Come back. I was trying to, to find a good spot and I Sorry. figured it was, you know. <laughs> no, you're perfect. You're, it's all good. It's all good. Um, I think it's a combination of, for one, what I think, because as I said reading Mike Flanagan's Tumblr post and learning that both of these stories are about kind of um, alcohol addiction and recovery. Um, I think that definitely plays into why I think Jack or Jack Nicholson was wrong for the part. Um, But I also am willing to concede that Stanley Kubrick had different thoughts for this part and played it entirely differently. So that kind of like messes with things, but we'll, we'll go based on, what I was thinking earlier, a character dealing with alcohol addiction and recovery. And uh, even though like Jack is an abusive piece of shit, um, he had been clean for five months and (laughs) allegedly, (laughs) allegedly, but we'll, we'll trust that he's been clean for five months. He wouldn't lie um, because that's what multiple people say. That's so Um, true. (laughs) He has no reason to. And you get the sense that he also like, There are times where he does care about Danny. um, And I think there are elements where he should have been even a slightly sympathetic character or even that you should have seen him like trying to be a good person. um, That because Jack Nicholson is a very particular looking man and Mm -hmm. he looks very creepy, um, which is why he does so well at the end of this movie and why like, I feel like he has a lot of kind of accolades for his performance in this movie, but because he looks so creepy um, and he looks very intimidating, you do not get a sense of sympathy or uh, you do not get the sense that he's trying to be a good person or trying to improve at any point. Uh Okay. Um, Additionally, the fact that he's a recovering alcoholic Um, I think the scenes where he does kind of break and start drinking alcohol or anything, I think you could have done a lot more with those scenes. And this is more on Kubrick's side of things, but he just kind of like gives in. He's like, okay, yeah, I'll drink. Um, But I feel like there should have been a lot more kind of like guilt on his part shown. Um, Mm hmm of just like struggling with that decision. Um, and another thing in relation to struggling, he knows the hotel's supposed to be empty. Why at no point do we see him being like, what's with all these ghosts around? Or like, what, what the fuck is this about? Uh, he just completely accepts it. And then afterwards, like if he's talking to Wendy or somebody, he's like, there was nothing. I don't know. Um, I just, it's really weird to me that there would never be a scene shown of him being like, even just like one scene where he's like, what the fuck's up with that? 
I... Okay, whatever. I'm going to check it out and just kind of go with the flow. I, I have something like... to say before everyone else says something <laughs> when Emma is done. Okay. <laughs> um, Those were kind of my big things. Um, For him being a focal character when there are three focal characters in a two and a half hour movie, I feel like his story could have been shown and developed a lot more than it was. And I think that was a real weakness. Uh, so my read on Jack is... Jeff is very offended and I apologize. <laughs> my read on Jack is that he is not sober by choice. He is sober by threat uh, from Wendy, which is why, um, A, he immediately just slips right back to it when given the opportunity after uh, all that. Um, but also why from the beginning of the movie, he looks like a man who's about to lose his shit at all times. I'm thinking to, to me that reads as guy who is really sick of looking for a job and his like, cause his teaching career doesn't seem to really be working out. His writing mm -hmm. career doesn't seem to be working out and his bitch wife won't even let him have a little drink type of attitude. Can I, can mm -hmm. I make a counterpoint? Okay. Based on the information we're given, mm -hmm. um, it was a self-imposed rule of if I drink again, leave me. That's um, what, which implies guilt. That's what. Uh, that's what but Wendy that's what Wendy the said. Doctor, but yeah, Wendy it... told the doctor that. That's why I'm saying. Yeah. Of the information we're given, but but when he's talking to Lloyd about it, uh, it seemed more like a threat from Wendy when he was telling the story. Yeah, um, it's it's a very different story the way he tells it. But this version of Jack, I think it was a threat, um, or he feels threatened into it. Yeah, it, book Jack, I'm sure said that and meant it, but movie Jack, I do not believe said it or meant it like that. Uh, on a ghost front, I will say, um, we do get to, when he interacts with ghosts directly. We are like a month and a half into his time at the Overlook roundabout. Mm -hmm. Um, and as such, uh, his mental state had deteriorated so heavily at that point. I think that he was just at that point assumed he was seeing things. And when it was more than that, he just didn't really care. I'd like to add to that as someone who has had the shining and not had anyone to give him any guidance. I'm wondering how much of this he's just started to take in stride through his life as just being something that happens um yeah, that that's possible. only he can see and so there's really no use in telling anyone else about it um can um, i the the why doesn't jack react more strongly to the ghosts thing kind of also i think i could tie into my read of what's going on with jack and the hotel do you mind if i just dive oh, into I'm, that yep. um yeah go for it also, just like without like uh, trying to be arguing with you or anything, I, I kind of feel like Jack's alcoholism arc does the stuff that it needs to do. I don't I I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like it works the way that it is and he doesn't need to be a model recovering alcoholic given the nature of the character that he is. But that's a, a different discussion, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. So to do with uh, the ghost front, though. My read of what's going on between Jack and the hotel is, as previously established, Jack has The Shining and is therefore, uh, you might say, more susceptible to psychic attacks in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And in going along with Dick Halloran's description of what's wrong with the hotel, he says uh, when a bad thing happens in a place, a residue of the bad thing kind of hangs around there. And he compares it to burnt toast. You can smell it for days afterward sometimes. And then he says a lot of the things that happened here weren't so good. I, I get the impression that this hotel has been home to such an immense amount of malice and wrongdoing in its time. That essentially what we see represented visually through the blood elevator is that it is just so filled with evil that if a an open receptacle, I suppose you could say, walks in, it will be filled with that evil. I think from the moment Jack enters the hotel, uh, we get that first blood elevator scene and Danny has his episode back at home. Uh, I think from the moment that 
that happens, the hotel has kind of like gotten a hold of Jack and it has started pouring its evil into him because he, mm, as yeah. previously established in our discussion, he has the shining and doesn't really know what he's doing with it never learned to deal with it so he doesn't know how to defend against that kind of stuff whereas danny uh sort of resists it more effectively because he was warned to whereas yeah. jack just kind of goes in and the hotel starts dumping things into his brain and you can actually see at the the the, the moment where the blood elevator scenes happen uh during some of the events of the movie there's like the you know how like every time that somebody's using the shining there's that like tea kettle noise Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. during one of the scenes where uh there's like uh an argument between uh jack and wendy it's like after jack has gone to room 237 to investigate what happened to danny there and he comes back and he lies and he tells wendy uh there's nothing there danny's just crazy actually um mm. and a liar during and and, and he, crazy and, yeah yeah <laughs> and and more than that he's not telling the truth during that discussion, there is that moment where you hear that tea kettle noise and there is a brief blood elevator clip. And then Jack just like turns on her suddenly and he starts like shouting at her. He's yelling about how he's let her fuck up his life this far and he's not going to let her ruin this, all that stuff. I think that's what that is showing us is essentially the hotel is catching him in an especially weak moment and it's capitalizing mm -hmm. on that by. Well, I mean, not even it may not even be a conscious thing. I'm assuming that the the hotel itself has like a will. It may not be that. It may just be like a high pressure evil system. And when Jack is in a more vulnerable emotional state, he is just kind of open to it. So then it's just mm -hmm. shoving more evil into him. And that's when he like explodes suddenly. Later on uh, in the scene where Wendy like walks into Jack's giant ass writing room and she finds the all work and no play papers and Jack walks over and he's all like suddenly he's all like goofy and animated the way that he is with Lloyd because he's had so much hotel dumped into him more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get a blood elevator scene right before he starts getting like aggressive and violent toward her in that scene so i think i think that's mm -hmm. kind of what's being done there is it's not that like he's not putting in an effort or he's not noticing the ghosts or anything like that it's just that like he's already having so much poured into him by this haunted hotel that when he starts seeing a, a bartender that will comfort him socially of course he's not going to question that he needs the comfort that that bartender offers whether that be in a mm. guy that he can complain to or a drink that he can drink. He just wants it so bad that, of course, he's not going to question it. And there's so much hotel in his mind already that it might be preventing him from questioning it even. And yeah, is my I think least. that you're all cor you're correct. And the hotel is sentient because yeah, I kind of um, tend to think that it is. It feels like it's well, intentional because specifically in the way that it does things. It provides him Lloyd and then it prevents lloyd from charging him money or tells lloyd not to charge him money uh -huh. orders from the house i think is the most orders the from most the house is so blatant, that's a fun it? that's a fun line <laughs> the hotels the hotel thought it was funny for that Absolutely. one i, I swear yeah. <laughs> but that's why i said yeah. this was similar to hill house because yeah the the, the entity yeah. in this is is the hotel during, yeah so i think you read is during an awful lot correct. of while I, I i haven't told anybody about this an awful lot of the time while i was watching hill house there were a number of scenes where i was watching it and i was like you know what if somebody were to do a remake of the shining i wouldn't mind mike flanagan doing it have you seen you said oh, you absolutely. haven't seen, I haven't Sleep, seen Dr. Sleep, Sleep yet I okay then i will keep don't my mouth shut recall <laughs> if i knew that he directed it at the time that i was watching it but like, that was literally something that I was thinking with Hill House specifically. It's just got such mm -hmm. shining vibes to so much of it. You can yeah. see that in the in Hill House. And then we do see, like, kind of those ideas that both things have also mm. expanded on in Doctor Sleep as well. Oh, cool. um, so I've been sitting here vibrating the whole time you talk because I that's all I'm going to say <laughs> on that. Like... Ah, it's such a <laughs> yeah. the hotel as a character and as an entity and as a creature is so interesting because, yeah. like like it's beautiful and why is it that way and kubrick's like it's an indian burial ground and i'm like shut up because <laughs> yeah, like i Jeff, think eldritch I... houses are so much more interesting 
They are yeah. fun. Uh, Jeff, I do think you're entirely right. Um, well, thanks for saying so. <laughs> this I kind of felt this, like I was I rambling think, and crazy a little bit. <laughs> no, you're, I, no, you're I, great. I you're beautiful. <laughs> um, this I think it largely comes down to like a taste thing oh, totally. for me. Yeah. Um, because like obviously Jack is being like evil house shoved down his throat sure. kind of stuff. And that's obviously affecting like how he's perceiving things. But we do get the scene where he is having the nightmare and he's really shaken yeah. by it. And Wendy pulls him out of it and he's like freaked the he fuck is, out. Yeah. I would have just loved some sort of like small acknowledgement, something of him in like kind of lucidness. Yeah. Being like if in that scene, what he the, was like, what, what are these people here for? Yeah. And I think it could have been done with the lady in room 237. I yeah. think it is. Or um, actually, maybe if in that scene he had been like, we should get out of here. And then that could kind of add to the conflict between him and Wendy later on, because she could be like, you said we should get out of here. And he'd be like, what? No, I had a nightmare. That was nothing. You stupid bitch. You know, all that stuff. Yeah, something. But I think for a person who's very manipulative, mm. um, the scene directly before he goes to the room, Wendy sees Danny injured. Yeah and accuses him and he's obviously had a history of this and he knows the consequences of like what happens if he hurts his son yeah. again um as we've established to go to the room see this come back to wendy and be like oh there's nothing there when he knows like the only other logical conclusion for wendy is jack did yeah. something um i feel like him kind of like being freaked out and maybe saying something and then maybe being like uh later later on being like ah no that was probably just like a dream or something i don't know what the fuck you're talking about just some something give me like something i feel like that would have helped me um, a lot like uh, as a manipulative person i feel like part of it like part of him being manipulative to me is him recognizing that Wendy already feels bad for having accused him now that Danny has said it was not Jack. Yeah. And so Jack is jumping on that feeling of guilt to suggest that, well, it was clearly not me and, and Danny said it wasn't me. Yeah. And so we have to think logically here. And he doesn't even bring himself back into the equation because to do mm. that would be to put... to to bring it back into the equation it's out of the equation now and he wants to keep it out of the equation mm -hmm. yeah so he's to me it's him purposefully keeping that back now that it's she feels bad about it danny said it didn't happen we're, we're yeah. going to yeah. to tell her to think logically here yeah which was one of my favorite Jeff, lines your hand scene. is raised yeah, I, just the the particular interplay of that series of scenes where danny comes in and he's got the bruises on his neck and uh Wendy is blaming Jack. So Jack in, you know, desperation goes to the gold room and meets Lloyd, the ghost bartender and everything. And what drives him into that room is desperation for a drink because he's so like emotionally affected by being accused of being the one of the, that hurt Danny. Right. But then when Wendy comes into the gold room looking for him and says, there's a crazy woman in the hotel, Danny said, she's the one who did that to him. He does not take a moment to be like, oh, so you don't think it was me anymore or something like that, or like acknowledge the fact that that's the reason he was off by himself. He doesn't take a moment mm. for that. He jumps straight to, well, that's ridiculous, you dumb woman. You know, like he doesn't skip a beat going straight back into manipulating her. It kind of feels like when Danny first walked into the room and he was all disheveled with the bruises on his neck and stuff and Jack just like sat there silently it feels like he sat there silently just because he couldn't think of a way to spin it. And, you know, that combined with the fact that he was legitimately like caught off guard by it because it's a weird thing to have happen. Mm -hmm. The I think the only moment we get of genuine Jack is very early on before before Danny gets hurt. Um but only just before Danny gets hurt, isn't it? I don't... Th this this movie does a great job of fucking with time, and I'm very time-blind as it is. <laughs> but I think the one time that we get that of, of Jack being genuine is that nightmare that he has. Yeah. I um, Which, like, 
like genuinely he is still a person hotel affecting him or not the hotel might have just come on a little too strong too fast uh Mm might have hit him a little too much at once um and i do think that in his conversation with danny he's being manipulative and we're seeing that power dynamic that i mentioned earlier there again but i don't think that he's being ingenuine when he says to danny and to lloyd that he doesn't want anything to happen to danny Mm -hmm. and i think that even though part of that is because he'd get in trouble again part of that is also because it's literally his son like Mm -hmm. this is like even even this version of jack can't be completely divorced from having hurt a child so oh, you also, know, it's just like he told Lloyd. I love that piece of shit. Yeah, but <laughs> also like, yeah, the way he describes the incident to Lloyd sounds so much like the way that he would have rehearsed it to sound. Like the way that he talks about, like, you know, mm. a, a momentary loss of muscular coordination, like all the big words. Because he feels a few extra foot pounds of energy per second. Per second. Like he has told this so many times to try and convince goes people full that it Walter wasn't White his mode. fault. I think he is he feels, full Walter White mode right. there. Yeah. And I think it's brought on by the same thing, which is like guilt and not knowing how to handle that guilt. Yeah. Not knowing how to say sorry. Yeah, not knowing how to admit um, that he did something that was just wrong. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to like get too bogged down oh, in sure, that sure. as we someone all, yeah. who's who's got stuff going on but i will say i think an important part of this conversation is there are certain things we cannot talk about because you have not seen dr sleep there are a lot of things we can't talk about oh no i was going to talk about my dad i wasn't going to talk about dr sleep i I don't give a shit about your dad i'm talking about dr sleep (laughs) nina let's talk about our dads (laughs) my dad loves this movie Your dad is great. I don't think we're talking about our dad here. (laughs) But yeah, we can't talk about Doctor Sleep. We really need to talk about Doctor Sleep. We can't stress enough that you will so bad about Doctor Sleep. We need to. Can we do? uh, Do we have a movie lined up next? Talking about hitting it early in uh, 2023. Yeah, I think we had kind of haphazardly tossed the idea of a flanagorama yeah yeah i suggested a flanagan <laughs> flanagorama yeah. i love that where we just went from his like oldest releases to his most recent releases but i like, want to do doctor sleep now hit by hit. i mean like yeah we can we do can that. do doctor sleep yeah we're, we, we are literally kind of bound of a, by no laws yeah, but we have no <laughs> Let's do uh, no plans that we are required his, to hold to his, or anything his movie releases are hush oculus uh, Oculus, Gerald's Game, and Doctor Sleep. Yep, uh, that's easy. Uh, there's it's also a Ouija Ouija. Resurrection or Ouija Origin. Of I don't want to watch a Ouija movie. Uh, uh, origin of Evil, I've heard, is actually okay, good. Okay, that's uh, that, that one's think it's Origin good. of Evil. I think it's Origin of Evil that's his. Yeah, yeah. The first one. There's was bad. also he's his first movie. I forget what it's called, but um, it's it's something okay. as well. Okay. Anyways, uh, we we can discuss all of that stuff elsewhere. Right now, we're talking about The Shining, and I yeah. oh, we're still talking about The Shining. I forgot I, would love, I was so ready to talk uh, about to Dr. take Dr. a Sleep. couple of minutes just to point out little details in specific actors' performances. Does that sound good to everybody? Because yeah. I've got mm-hmm. a number of them that yeah. I made notes of. Um, do we want to start with anyone in particular? I want to start with Danny. We can start with Danny. Danny. I love uh, the kid. I want to shout out Danny's actor Danny as an amazing he kid was actor. An incredible Danny kid Lloyd actor. did so and then well. Just didn't go on to movie. be an actor in anything else. And good for and him. Good for him. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, yeah. He's he's real good in this. I've heard people criticize him as being a little bit wooden, like he's not a good kid actor. But I got to be honest, I feel like kids in real life just act more wooden than anybody thinks. Yeah. Just like mm-hmm. in the, the think, one scene yeah. where uh, Danny's been in like the games room and then he goes and joins his parents and Jack says, oh, you get tired of bombing the universe. And Danny just goes, yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. literally yeah. the way yeah, the kid totally react real. to that question. Like, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that's like the, all the kids I ever cut in the barber shop. They're like that. Especially, he acts like at least half old, of them. Yeah. Especially like, a kid that has no friends. Kids only don't act wooden when they're around adults they absolutely trust. Yeah. Or other kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And Danny doesn't have. Almost, Danny has. Danny has zero <laughs> friends and also no adults he trusts. A dad who <laughs> tore his arm out one time. Yeah. Like so yeah. like. I remember being I do also a kid want to and shout feeling out. the need to like attenuate my responses to certain adults, even though I wasn't like in danger as a kid or anything. <laughs> like, yeah, I just didn't want my mom to hear exactly. About it. But Emma, yeah, <laughs> there was earlier. You all talked about how Danny acted differently around Jack Nicholson versus Shelley yeah. Duvall, which is totally valid. But I think that really came through extremely well, and he did really, really well. And that scene where Jack Nicholson kind of like forces him into a hug yeah. on the bed and is just like, oh, I love you so, so much. So creepy in that like, scene. Like, so uncomfortable. Oh my God. It was very uncomfortable. And the Danny's kid is just, just like, when do I get to walk he's away? Like, when can I leave? Yeah, when are you gonna let exactly. Me go? He's like, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. He's like, what can I say to get out of this situation as quickly as possible? Yes, Dad, I do love you. yeah i really liked how danny and um and dick's reactions to the shining visions were both so similar and so nuanced like they and their reactions also both being very urgent and like just very serious i really enjoyed the first scene where danny um danny and tony are talking in the mirror and then danny has that vision that's like some of my favorite kid acting i've ever seen the way that his like expression changes is so good yeah yeah there's a lot in this movie because like it's just like watching people's expression change over a long shot yeah it's so cool Mm -hmm. what was that emma because there's there's like kid actors or like child Mm -hmm. actors like the stranger things kids where Mm -hmm. they're like early teens or like just under that and then there's like kid yeah, this kid's actors, like eight years old. Like, yeah, like young. Um, I think he may be even. I, I mean, you might know more than me, but he looks younger than eight. He does seem I younger than eight. I am terrible at gauging maybe children's like five or ages. Six. I pulled the number eight out of a hat because it felt right. So I have yeah. no idea how old he was actually. I just guessed eight. Yeah. But for a kid that yeah. young, he, he does so fantastic. Good. Mm-hmm. I think you might be right on the money. Oh yeah, me. He was or eight Jeff. years old oh, when they filmed this it. movie. I've never correctly guessed a person's age before. Right now, especially a kid. Good job. Hey, yeah. All right. I'm killing it today. So, um, in talking about yeah, that, as of we October were... 13th, he turned 50 this year. Hey. Oh, or oh 13th, happy I'm birthday, sorry. Danny Lloyd. Happy yeah. birthday. Months late. <laughs> um. Okay. So we mentioned Dick Halloran. I fucking love Scatman Crothers performance as Dick Halloran. He only gets so oh, much Dick. to do, but my God, this good boy. Hold on. I, actually, before talking about the acting on this character, actually, I want to just talk about Dick, the character for a minute. This man, mm-hmm. the head chef of the Overlook Hotel, knows his inventory so backwards and forwards that he can recite all of it from memory while simultaneously using his telepathic powers to ask a child if he wants ice cream and while he's doing both of these things simultaneously he remembers to crack jokes this man's incredible and and i am so angry that i will never taste his food Right. You know it's the he, best. Also, <laughs> he also is so good at the shining, he accidentally, apropos of absolutely nothing, picked up Danny's neck. Yeah. Wait. Mm. I'm sorry. During the filming, um, Danny Lloyd was six years old. Oh, oh my God. Yo, uh-huh. shit. Oh, I was right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. A- apparently, he did not know right. that wrong. The Shining was a horror movie not. during filming. I did yeah. hear that. He didn't know it was a horror yeah, movie. Yeah, he didn't know. Yeah. I remember, like, back in the day, they tried to disguise that for kids. Yeah. A lot more I remember hearing that about um, the, the Sixth Sense as well. Haley Joel Osment, mm-hmm. like, didn't know what kind of movie it was. I th- yeah. Honestly, they had that kid I th- say "I see dead people," and he didn't know it was. A he thought it was movie. a family comedy. I think it's <laughs> fantastic <laughs> how often actors don't know what the movies are. Oh, uh, Avatar: Way yeah. of Water, great example. Oh, yeah. uh, one of the leads, yeah, the one actress they filmed who was that like, movie so yeah, long ago. She, was like, she thought it, it came out, out and flopped. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah some, I, I know what. Uh, wild to what me that Johnny this Depp literally says he literally never watches any of his own movies. I mean, I got to be yeah. honest. I don't know if I would. I feel like I it would. It feels weird, I right? Would for sure. I can't even rewatch VODs of my own performances on Twitch. I get. I <laughs> listen to my own <laughs> like, podcast I'm... religiously every single week. So, like. <laughs> <laughs> I, <Fair. laughs> I don't know. I, I, I do, do too, but because I edit. I do <laughs> because so I long, have yeah. really bad ADHD and people bring things up in the server that I don't remember saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh. What a mood. <laughs> I think I've gotten to the point where I'm comfortable with my own voice and hearing it back and hearing my like speech yeah. patterns. But seeing myself, especially like full body, would be like yeah, yeah. a completely different thing. I think I would micro analyze myself way too much. Yeah, I can't even look in the mirror for too long, much less like. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, I'm yeah, not no. saying I would be happy with it. I'm just saying I would watch it. <laughs> 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 okay okay I, it would be you're forgiven it would Jeff. be like watching a train wreck probably like i would just be like oh no i'm so bad but i can't look away but like <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah what are we talking about scatman we're talking Cruthers. about we're... scatman crothers as dick halloran in stanley kubrick's stephen king's the shining wayne gretzky michael scott <laughs> 1980s thank you yeah <laughs> um i i really like um i really like dick halloran i like the way that scatman crothers uh portrays him i think he does a, a real real good job he just seems like a cool dude yeah i'm so glad yeah. danny had someone right um yeah the fact also that he is so good at keeping his cool while also panicking the, like the entire time from the moment that he suspects something is wrong till the moment he fucking he's dies. barely holding like, it together on, that whole time yeah i you can tell i love the acting on the plane where he is just sitting staring straight yeah, ahead and then he turns around to ask like, like when they'd be landing yeah and then he gets to the 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 lie that he tells and the way that he tells it to be able to get up to the overlook uh -huh. is so flawless. Yeah. And he's just, he, he pulls it off so well because, of course, he's not going to say, hey, I suspect there are ghosts afoot. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Me suspecting there's ghosts afoot. Yeah. And that also, um, I, like when he's when he's sitting and talking with Danny and Danny asks him about he's telling him about The Shining and stuff. And uh, and Danny asks him what's in room 237 because Tony warned him about room 237 and the way that Dick Halloran re reacts to that, the way he like freezes and he's like room 237 like this kid is asking me about the evil room fuck why does he know about that like you can see the wheels turning in his head and then he's like nothing. There's nothing in there and you've got no reason to be in there. So don't go in there because there's nothing there. Are you afraid of that room? I'm not afraid of no yeah, room. Yeah, like <laughs> I love so that. He's so blatantly afraid <laughs> of it. Really he's funny. just like, you just stay away from it. Like <laughs> man who just said we can both read minds lying to the only other man in the room that can read minds. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay, Dick. Good job. My I am not afraid of room 237 shirt is raising an awful lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Who else do we want to compliment? Uh, Obviously, we got a shout out. Oh, Shelly. Shelly. Let's talk about 100%. Shelly Duvall. Okay, I want to talk I, fucking phenomenal. just for a second really specifically about the scene where she talks to the doctor. Oh, that's what I want to talk oh, about, too. Fantastic. Okay, when she goes to light her cigarette, you see how much she, like, her hands are a little shaking? Bit? Yeah, it's the kind of thing that like you see it and you're like, oh, did they only have half a take for this? Like what? But no, it's on purpose, because then as she goes on mm -hmm. to talk, if you watch that cigarette in her hand, you see how she doesn't take a drag. She hardly puffs on it. Well, she does. All. But like, yeah, she literally only takes like two drags of it in the entire scene, though. She's got it in her hand the entire time. She's got it pointing up. And as it burns down, the ash just keeps getting longer and longer until it's almost the length of the entire cigarette. And she just keeps not tapping it off because she's too mm -hmm. distracted, maintaining appearances with the doctor. Holy fuck. Mm -hmm. It's so good. What yeah. were you about to say? Uh, I mm. love you can see during her story when she realizes she said the wrong thing mm. and the doctor starts making a face 
Yeah. And she starts backpedaling real and she's hard. She's like, oh, it's no, like, it's the kind well, of thing you, you know, might do by you accident didn't... all the time. Like, you know, you 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 grab them and move them in traffic all the time. But this time it was a little harder than he meant yeah. to. Like. You can see her losing control of the conversation so rapidly yeah. And trying so hard to bring it back down and say, no, my husband's a really good guy. I promise he's such a good guy. He's a really great guy. And he's not. He's not. You know? He's not. Yeah. But... <laughs> and she was like heavily criticized for her performance when it first came out. Wanna right? I'm insane. just remembering that. Yeah, That's so worst rude. ridiculous. Yeah, it was worst actress. Which I find just absolutely incomprehensible. I believe they have retracted they they... that. The Razzies retracted it because they realized how poor taste it was yeah. to award worst actress to the woman who was abused into that performance. It's not even what she wanted to yeah. do. When in addition yeah. to that, they should also be embarrassed that they gave a worst actress award to a really, really good performance. Honestly, mm -hmm. no. Embarrassing. Yeah, she she is just I love that so scene. good in so many like obvious and subtle ways. Like, my God, it's just she's so good. Speaking of obvious and subtle, yeah. I want to do my Jack Nicholson shout Let's out. Let's go. Let's talk um, about Jack climbing up the stairs and he's in full swagger oh, mode yeah. with his. Come on, it's me. Hey, he's just Lloyd the bartender voice. Bits as he approaches and he's doing her. That, but then. <laughs> After he yells at her about she's had her entire life to think things over, what's a few more minutes going to do? Um, when he realizes uh, he's in danger and he his entire attitude shifts to Wendy, give me the bat. Yeah, like that. Like he just the entire turns. shift. And it's what it. It gave me goosebumps. It's one of the most chilling moments in the movie where it's already very uncomfortable because we know Jack is capable of bad things at this point because he's just been, I don't know, he's been horrible to Wendy the whole time, yeah. but now he's like, he's coming in with an energy and it doesn't feel good. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the whole act is turned off and with the, like the driest contempt filled voice, he's just like, give me the bat. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of contempt, mm. all the way back to the beginning of the movie, right? Opening scenes, the uh, the job interview with Allman. You pay attention to the way he talks to Allman in that scene. A little bit. A little First bit. time meeting him, but he talks to him as though he's like kind of familiar, like he's a friend. You know, he's just kind of like, "Hey, I'm Jack Nicholson. This is the job interview scene." Ha <laughs> ha. You know. And then immediately after that, he calls Wendy, and you notice mm -hmm. his voice when he's on the phone with Wendy. Suddenly he's not Jack Nicholson oh, yeah. doing his, you know, his cool job interview thing. Suddenly he's like, I've got an awful lot of paperwork to do and I won't be back until 10. It's like super businesslike mm -hmm. and impersonal. And you would expect those to be like yeah. reversed. Mm -hmm. You would expect him to be businesslike and impersonal for the job interview with that guy that he doesn't That's know. So, it's and so 80s. more personal and jokey with like his wife or something. Or maybe like, I'm sorry that I won't be back until 10. I've got all this paperwork, something like that. But no, he's just like. Sorry, wife. <laughs> I won't mm -hmm. be back until late. And it he he sounds like he's just talking to a business associate. And he does this a couple more times throughout the rest of the movie as well, including the breakfast in bed scene. I, a lot of his dialogue yeah. in the breakfast Ooh. in bed scene feels to me like he's it's mocking her with it. Yeah. No, he's just sitting there it, dipping his bacon in the eggs. And like talking, yeah, at I her. knew what was going to be around every corner. It physically made me uncomfortable that he never said thank you. He never mm -hmm. thanks her for anything. No. Mm. Mm hmm. God, I. Ugh. Oh. Ugh. Even in what some people call one of the only cute scenes in the movie. Who's calling no. it that? People call that Ooh. scene cute. One person in complaining, <laughs> one person on Tumblr complaining about how bad it is in, as an adaptation of the book because Jack doesn't have any character said there are two moments where we can see Jack having any sympathy towards Winding, Wendy and labeled the breakfast scene as one and the other is being the nightmare scene, which is correct. But the fucking nightmare scene's good. Nightmare scene, correct. I sorry I could not take any of the rest the of their criticism seriously. No, that's just... other than the other thing 
The other thing that really makes me mad about this movie, not well, can, we can come back to acting in a yeah, sec, yeah. sorry. The other thing that makes me mad about the movie as an adaptation is something that I always forget until other people point mm. it out because I'm just so used to it being um, a thing. F- but I keep forgetting the dick dies in this movie. It like mm-hmm. I, it startled me when it came up in Doctor Sleep. It startled me when it happened. He does in not this in the movie. book. Oh, he does not I die didn't know in that. the book. Okay. In, He's that stuff is so out of nowhere too. Like he spends so much it's time so... getting there that you assume he's going to accomplish something when he arrives, and then Jack yeah. just he has runs so much out more and gets character him. in the book. And they kind of uh, fridge is not the correct term because fridging is a specific term, but you know they get rid yeah. of him in a really kind of just needless way. It's really frustrating. I've Um, actually heard, um, well, this is a specific thing from the guys on the Dead and Lovely podcast. When similar things to that happen to characters in other movies, they refer to it as getting scatmanned. I was just about to say, what is it, getting scatmanned? That's what I, okay, so I'm over here looking for a term, but this is the term originator over here. That's that's what that is. And I I haven't heard anyone outside of Ben and Steve say it well, but i'm gonna start using it now because it's so the, like it's shout out to ben and steve to, to really to phrase it because you know i don't know i like dick halloran as He's a character cool. uh do you does anyone want a fun stephen king universe fact since we have oh had i actually know this. this episode he's connected to it do you i yeah, know this because yeah, of ben dick and steve halloran. actually because uh ben and dick steve halloran read books and they like stephen pulled, king yeah. <laughs> couldn't be me oh, right <laughs> i just I need to, when you said Stephen King universe, my brain interpreted that as a Stephen universe oh, fact. Oh my god. <laughs> and I was like... You were like, how does that I was tie like, into this? Really? Like, like, what? There's something to do with the Shining and Stephen universe? <laughs> Regular really show funny. I'd expect. Also, but, there, but there probably universe. totally is, honestly. There's probably something probably. to do with uh, fucking Ronaldo or whatever his name was. I feel like I have a very specific memory there. Um, that's neither here yeah, nor anyways. there. Um, Dick Halloran uh, used The Shining in it to pull Mike Hanlon's parent or dad, I think, out of the black spot in the 30s in uh, in Derry. Yeah, I believe that being the bar that burned Uh down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. That's cool. Very neat. Yeah. Very cool. Which I know they're all connected. Yeah. Stuff like all Stephen King's books. Mm hmm. Whatever. Which I think is a neat it thing. It is frustrating to do. that that means that the stupid clown is like a core problem in every story, even if only in the <laughs> That's background. Amazing. We already yeah. knew about this. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it, it just pisses me off to remember. Yeah, if there there used to be an extended cut of the shining where every time there was a blood elevator scene, the elevator door would open a little bit wider and Pennywise was inside. <laughs> Dancing, of course. <laughs> It was, it was Tim popping Curry's version. Full of blood. <laughs> it was Tim Curry's version, as was fashionable for the time. Right, right. <laughs> of course. Uh, but will Pennywise be in the Dark Tower show made by Mike? Yeah, yeah, he so. will, but only on the technicality that he looks like a completely different character in that. If they cast <laughs> Bill Skarsgård to play that character anyway, I think that would be well, fun. Because if it's... Be if fun. it's because so the character is played by a scars guard in the stand because the character oh. from the dark tower is in the stand and is played by a scars guard oh well all right then yes sorry i thought i mentioned that in the it episode but that is have. that is um, i don't know i don't that remember is fun i always forget that the stand exists i'm not familiar with it so it's just one of those it, Stephen I King liked properties the that beginning I of the book and then they started bringing in the Dark Tower nonsense. Wow. And I was like, why couldn't this just be a fun, like, pandemic? <laughs> I want like, something that's not connected story. to other Stephen King properties, damn it. Yes, please. Because it's just like a cool, like, end of the world pandemic story. Mm. And then all of a sudden, people start talking talking about this spooky man in black. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't I can't be in, in like engulfed in this world anymore. <laughs> nice. um. <laughs> all right. Anyway, back to Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. Okay, so there was this one scene uh, in the beginning. Allman is showing them around. He shows them the gold room. He shows them the bar, explains that it's empty. Jack says, we don't drink. And Allman says, you're in luck. Ha ha. And they, then Dick Halloran walks up and uh, other stuff happens. 
Anybody pay mm-hmm. close attention to the way that Jack says we don't drink? I definitely noticed something, but I couldn't tell you what it was. Like, yeah. It's like passive aggressive. The way he says it is he takes like oh, a yeah, deep he's breath. Like, he's like, mm-hmm. we don't drink. <sighs> like I exaggerated a little Ooh. bit just then, but only a little bit. He sounds so annoyed about it and he's not even like hiding it. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, definitely picked up on that. Yeah, no, I that's one of the things that I really loved is how many times. Uh, that's that's why one of the reasons I like him earlier in the movie is like. He's just like that constantly. Yeah. It's like, hey, man, they hey, can man. tell what you're saying. Right. Everyone, <laughs> he wants. No, but he wants. Uh, he wants them everyone to, to tell what he's saying. And he, he wants, wants everyone to know he's to being know held that back he's communicating in life. That. All right, I've I've held this back for two hours. Are you saying Wendy or Wendy? Who are you accusing? I'm asking you, you, Wendy. It's you, Nina, because you're the one who's been saying Wendy all this time. (laughs) No, it's that's just it's my. This might be the only time that my Washingtonian accent is coming out. I'm sorry, a Wendy, a Wendy, because it's the same thing with everyone says that we say bag weird as well. But I have like trained that one out of myself. Oh, wait, is Washington a, a place where you don't say bag, you say beg? Wait, yeah. do people say milk there instead of milk? No, oh, okay. we're not that bad. <laughs> no, we're not whoa, whoa. that I know disgusting. people from Western Pennsylvania who say milk instead of milk, and they also say okay, bag no, instead no. of bag. So, so it's I like egg that, like, and bag, and like that's kind of like the only things that I've ever been told are Washingtonian things, and it seems like the sound in Wendy is also one of those things that you guys are good. Like, now I'm self-conscious of it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I typed it out in the search no, bar I didn't earlier. even pick oh, up on it for you. <laughs> I, I was know, just like, are you I saying swear. Wendy question mark? I Every time like I was just like, am I going to say, no, I'm not going to say anything about this. <laughs> but it's it's been two hours. I got to say something. It's literally just an accent thing. I promise. I'm not visualizing Nina playing it in my the head. accent card. Now Nina's going to say she doesn't want to read the Ooh. notes or something like that. <laughs> uh, you guys are going to make fun of me for how I say Wendy. Oh, one more thing. There is this one line. That is said by multiple characters. Three, actually. Is it you got the shining in you? No. Because that was actually <laughs> just no, no, no. The, the, Yeah, the part where Danny is like, what are you talking about? And Dick Halloran is like, it's Stephen King's The Shining. That's what my grandma used <laughs> to call King, it. Stanley Kubrick's yeah. The Shining, 1980, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. That was what my grandma used to Kid. call it. <laughs> And we would sit on the porch <laughs> and just Stephen King's Stanley Kubrick's shine Wayne Gretzky Michael Scott at each other all day long. <laughs> uh, okay, so the thing that I was going to say, okay. In one scene, Jack says to Danny, I wish we could stay here forever and ever and ever. Mm. And then the ghost twins say to Danny, come play with us, Danny, forever and ever and ever. I don't remember who says it first, but I love the idea that that's just something twins? that the twins aren't even saying that. it. It's the house saying it. Mm. It said it into Jack's mind. So he says it and it's saying it to Danny through the faces of the twins. I thought that was uh, I just thought that was a, a neat little detail there. Yeah. I absolutely agree. Neato. I'm like looking through my notes to see if there's anything notable that I've been forgetting to mention so far. I've probably talked enough that if I've forgotten anything, it's because God doesn't want me to talk about it, though. <laughs> God is really so, silencing speaking you. Speaking of notes, do we well, want to move yeah. to a certain set of notes? Yes. All right, Jeff, you, you keep reading. You see if you find anything I notable have to say. My notebook, me. and I've put it okay. down away from me because we're approaching... For the last the time. We're approaching the, the only... length of the movie on, the, on my recording here, and I know that we're going to cut mm-hmm. some off the front end, <laughs> but like, I feel like I am holding us back a bit. So, <laughs> All right. Are you guys going to make fun of how, how I say Wendy in this? Yeah. Never. Every time. More. Okay. I was, just, I was very confused. Uh, that's super fair. I am super self-conscious of it now, <laughs> but as someone who says things while visualizing them, I can promise you I have only I have only been saying it as is spelled. Wendy, you want to beg a water? <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, st- I'm too close to my mic for you to be making jokes like that. Okay. Uh, here we go. 
I'm gonna skip pretty pretty far down in here. No um, skip in the crochet ties. Notes. There's no, good there's early, good early notes. notes. We've been over a lot of oh, them. Okay. It's the crocheted tie. Um, but I really want to hit Oh, actually, this one that does remind me of some other stuff that I forgot to mention. <laughs> <laughs> Noah says, The fucking Donner Party. You know Stephen King decided to drop that in to try and make his world seem bigger. Parentheses. I checked. It's in the book. Wendy thinks about it. Because mm-hmm. huh. I was like, maybe this is just a line. But no, Wendy thinks about it in the book. She's like, If we were a little further west in the Sierras, this would be where the Donner Party was. <laughs> was that actually where the Donner Party was or were they further west further west is what the book and the movie both what say. about in real life I don't give a shit man the Overlook Hotel isn't real <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> who gives a fuck like, were they in Colorado or <laughs> I have no idea they were further west in the Sierra right. Jack Torrance told Do me I that Jack Torrance like I know US history what was that Emma to Wendy, maybe. <laughs> Do I look like I know U.S. history? Fair enough. Maybe. So the daughter party bit. was in Nevada, in present-day Reno area, apparently. Oh. And I don't know where that is in regards to Colorado. It's further west, I don't know actually, geography. in the Sierras. <laughs> Jack Torrance was right. He wouldn't lie to us. <laughs> so <laughs> true. Uh, n- anyway, Nevada is I just further Googled west that. than Colorado, though. So. Okay. See, and I said Nevada. Are you guys going to make fun of me for that one? I didn't even no. notice. Okay, good. We're going to move right You didn't along. say Nevada 17 Ooh, times. You have said I got to be honest. Lot. I don't know if Nevada is the correct pronunciation or not. Is it Nevada or Nevada? Nevada. I, I, like, I've heard it. it I think matter. that's one of those things. Equally both ways. That's got to be one of those like, things. Uh, it whatever. doesn't matter. Yeah. Um. Okay, sorry. The Donner Party, though, I did want to bring up because, like, the 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 scene is so funny to me that Wendy <laughs> brings up the Donner Party. Jack is like, yeah. "Yeah, the Donner Party. They ate people." And Danny's like, "That's kind of fucked up." And Wendy's like, "Jack, it's like Wendy, you brought yeah, that she up. Did bring it up. It's fine. Yeah. He saw on it TV. on the television. Yeah. Oh, jeez, Louise." Um, There's a really fun like subtext in this movie about Jack rejecting technology. Because, like, he says that thing about the TV kind of, like, scornfully. And throughout the entire movie, he is only ever really seen interacting with his typewriter. Whereas uh, uh, Wendy and Danny both, like, watch TV. Mm -hmm. It's not that he doesn't know how to... uh to use technology because he dismantles it pretty right, heavily. Yeah, it's that but, he doesn't um, like it. <laughs> um, okay, so continuing on. Um, Jack does a little uh, spooky woo yeah. at, one, at one point. Yeah, whatever. And Noah says Jack's little woo just, just like Jeff for real. <laughs> 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 um... Noah Noah says, dumbass voice. So Jack could see them in the maze from the model inside? What does that mean? <laughs> I did the voice. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, uh, well, uh, intellectual voice. Well, you see, it symbolizes how he is uh, a foreboding presence over their life. even No, when he's it not symbolizes present. that Kubrick liked a cool shot and didn't care. <laughs> That's yeah. why I said intellectual voice, Noah, because I know that, but I'm going to... Yeah, I was, I'm sorry. I forgot to preface mine with realist voice. <laughs> <laughs> this bit brought to you by, um, I don't know, Noah says... <laughs> Oh, I'm not getting into that one. We're moving on. What? Are you, uh, he asks for a glass of bourbon and he pours him a glass of Jack oh, yeah, Daniels. Lloyd is a I found that to be funny. Tanker. Yeah. Because that's not, it's just, even in an era gonna, before bourbon, because bourbon's super big right, right now. Sure. And people are real pretentious bourbon but nuts about then, it. Surely people but even Tennessee. then, Jim Beam existed. Yeah, like, it says Tennessee, Tennessee whiskey, whiskey and right bourbon are not the, the same. Label. It's just, it, they are different. Yeah. Bourbon is heavier. On the other hand, like, I don't this. know, you know. Not to I'm be, right. Not to be Alfred the, the fuck, or whichever, yeah, it was Alfred the asparagus, wasn't it? I'm right. The asparagus guy. <laughs> That's me. I'm the asparagus in VeggieTales. We're going to get letters about this. <laughs> they can send all the letters they want. I am right. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't, it's not this even a question. <laughs> We're also going to get letters over me 
saying the wrong name for the asparagus, whose name I don't Archibald. remember. Archibald. Archibald. Call him Alfred, anyway. like an amateur. Come on. <laughs> no Nina says. doesn't know anything about Veggie Tales, guys. Fake. What? I'm not fake getting into this. Veggie. I'm not getting into this. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Noah says, um, Nina oh. seeing Dick's house. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did I make a couple you were gonna comments say something on Dick, about that. <laughs> Dick's choice in in wall art, which is that he has great taste. Fantastic, yes. Um, it's be- He has some beautiful art. They up. are really, really um, good paintings. Like. They are really good paintings. I thought they were photos. I'm pretty uh, sure they're paintings. Doesn't matter. Beautiful. Either way, yeah. Um, Noah says, uh, J- Jack wiping his hand on Grady's jacket after pointing out a spot I love on his that friend so was really much. good. He's like, oh, you got a spot of avocado on you yourself there. And he pats him on the back and leaves a big ass avocado hand print. <laughs> What is avocado? Okay, so I looked it up at one point. Actually, it is like oh. a very thick eggnog, more or less. It's oh, okay. kind of That's, it's kind of like, assumed, a, like a, but you know. a a thin custard with a lot of brandy in it, more or less. It sounds I so fucking that. delicious. Honestly, I want to drink so the bad. shit out of that. New holiday drink just dropped. Right? Gamers, the new holiday drink. It's also it's just eggnog. It's just eggnog again. again. again yeah. um, okay, eggnog here we go. <laughs> Noah says the voices Danny does are really quite fantastic. I love Danny's Tony voice. It's oh, so yeah. good. I think it's just like for a six year old. Yeah, I okay, so given the fact that he's six years old, I think what he's doing is just like an inhale. Okay, but apparently, fun facts. We're getting into the fun facts section now. Also, um, he was the one, Danny Lloyd was the one who decided to do a voice and to do the finger thing when he was speaking as Tony. Or like maybe well, he was instructed to do, to do a voice, but he like improvised the finger thing yeah the finger thing was it's iconic yeah. good job danny mm-hmm. um noah said dick's really about to fly all the way back to his job because he had a really bad dream he's right but I mean, still yeah yeah uh, uh well y- y- you know when when your bad dream is actually a psychic call for help from a six-year-old <laughs> mm-hmm. uh noah says god dude please stop that road runner i don't want to hear another beep beep Beep, beep. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of wondering what the significance of the Roadrunner specifically is there. I don't know because like, they're get about because they're about be to get like, chased, like, but they're not going to get, get caught it, in I get the way it. that like the Roadrunner is always getting get, chased, but never. Danny caught. is literally about to pull a Roadrunner in the maze when he backtracks on his own steps and hides oh, and shit. gets Jack lost in the maze. That's a very That's Roadrunner, a very Road Roadrunner Coyote kind of move. move. If it just included Jack comedically running into a wall when he loses him, that would mm-hmm. clinch it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No notes on that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That <laughs> that checks All out. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Noah says, and we have fun facts for this one. Noah says the camera tracking the axe looks amazing. Now I want to preface this by saying when I was watching the scenes of Jack Nicholson with the axe, I was thinking to myself, this man is so fucking precise with his axe movement. Like it's almost like he knows exactly where to hit it in the most like efficient way to get through the I door. Wonder if, okay. And then if he happens to have some insider knowledge or something that made him especially good at chopping down doors. What might that be? <laughs> yeah, literally so, my thought process. This is I'm really hoping, Emma, that you have not heard this trivia before before because this is this like is so fun. the really fun <laughs> trivia from the shining uh jack nicholson used to be a firefighter and what yeah no he used to be a firefighter and he was so good at chopping the door down that it was like a couple hits and the door was splinters and kubrick was like can you like rein it in a little bit and no matter what he did he couldn't stop demolishing doors (laughs) so they had to get him an extra thick reinforced hardwood door so it would take him longer to chop through like and he was still knocking those yeah. out in if no you time. Watch the way flat. he cuts through it in the keeper takes of the movie. The, the first time that I saw it, I was like, surely nobody can chop a door apart that fast. Turns out and that was the turns world's out, strongest a chunk could door, chop a door that he was destroying. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, it's it's That's amazing. Hands down the best trivia yeah. about this movie is that they could not find a door strong enough <laughs> to fit Kubrick's vision of what the door should yeah. look like getting chopped or, up or of how long it should take Jack to chop it down. Okay, but here's the big thing. And I'm going to throw you uh the fun fact on why Stanley Kubrick couldn't be shitty to Jack Nicholson here. Jack Nicholson oh, yes. Yes. was fucking with Stanley Kubrick constantly in the making of this movie. Okay, so Kubrick <laughs> was like continuously rewriting the script while they were shooting, which everyone on Earth found very frustrating because most actors are used to having their lines for a little while before shooting, whereas he would be giving them fresh pages like every single day. Like sometimes mm -hmm. during the shoots, they would be receiving fresh pages that they would have to be incorporating and stuff. So Jack Nicholson, basically, once this started happening, was like, no, fuck this. I'm not playing this game. So he would refuse to look at any of his lines until right before shooting the scene. Oh, and my God. <laughs> there were an absolute ton of scenes that, you know, you can find all these stories about how they, you know, just spent eight hours doing the back and forth shots of like, you know, Danny and Scatman talking at that table. And it took them like an entire very long shooting day to get just that scene. And it was insane. It was crazy. They had to do, you know, 500 takes of everything. Jack Nicholson was managed. He, he I can talk. Jack Nicholson managed <laughs> to basically hack Stanley Kubrick, get himself out of that kind of treatment by after a few takes. He would look to Stanley and he would say, did you like that, Stanley? Um, I, for this, for that take, I, uh, I did everything with one eye shut because I thought, you know, maybe, uh, the character might have one eye shut for this scene. <laughs> did you, did you think that was good? <laughs> and he didn't actually do that, but he would say that he did it. And Kubrick, without even looking up from the monitor he was watching, would say, uh, yeah, that was great. Um, why don't we get one with both eyes open though, just in case we want to do that instead. <laughs> and then they would do like two or three more takes and just be done that's hilarious just throw the guy so for the biggest I wonder, loop <laughs> I wonder if Jack Nicholson and all of his firefighter experience approached <laughs> the door chopping scene and was like I am gonna wreck this shit <laughs> and just destroyed the door as hard as he could to not give Kubrick what he wanted and then Kubrick was like could you dial it back, go a little slower? And I wonder if at that point, because surely, even with all of his firefighter knowledge, he could have just like fudged it and done it poorly enough that it would take longer and stuff, right? It's very easy to attenuate your abilities to that point. Uh, I think the reason they had to construct the world's strongest door for Jack Nicholson to chop it down is because Jack Nicholson just refused to sandbag that door chopping because this was finally a situation where somebody else had power over Stanley Kubrick. You like that one, Stanley? I reduced <laughs> the like door to one? splinters in a couple of seconds because I just kind of <laughs> yeah. thought that's what the character like, would do. <laughs> obliterated this thing because I thought it made sense for Jack Torrance to be an unstoppable door eating machine. <laughs> Did you like that? Stanley? Iconic. <laughs> I think that's what was going on with that is he was probably he had to be exhausted, right? Like how many doors did he destroy Enough. before they finally brought in the big one? Surely he was exhausted by that, but he was committed to being a dick to Stanley Kubrick and just destroying those doors too goddamn fast. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Genuinely. Oh my God. Good movie, long episode. Long episode, good movie. Mm-hmm. You know what else is a long good movie? Good episode, long movie. <laughs> Another long movie is... Um, the doctor sleep. Doctor sleep. Doctor sleep. The doctor's sleep. The doctor is in, and he's snoozing. Doctor sleep coming up <laughs> next time. I think, right? Like we yeah, agree on that. I, I, yeah, I'm it feels down. like we all agree I'm excited. On that, yeah. I'm yeah, so excited. I'm so pumped. It's honestly, possibly the best movie of 2019 for me. I got. I don't, I don't know remember what else what came, else out. came out, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, um, just real quick before we fully wrap up, um, if anyone was listening to this episode and really hoping that I would just go feral about conspiracy theories and like the moon landing and oh, the yeah. colors and uh, all of that stuff, uh, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. If 
anybody wants it, I would be I, I, I want I, we it. We probably wouldn't need the entire group together if everyone doesn't want to do it. But if anybody would be interested in us like revisiting this movie just to do a deep dive on the conspiracy theories and shit i will be entirely in for that if anybody else know. wants to we do could it. all watch uh room 237 no because that one's so full of bullshit though i don't know that i want to have to sift through all watch of the it bullshit anyway. if that okay. is what we do i am willing to sit through that bullshit and like i don't know write down the best parts yeah, or something we can do we I can do hear a the conspiracy theory we can do you know the angelic conspiracy? numbers that stanley kubrick employs <laughs> we can do a conspiracy theory oh, bonus episode. This isn't a Darren Aronofsky movie. <laughs> conspiracy theory What'd bonus. What'd you say, Nina? Yeah, we I, can do a bonus I, I episode. I feel like if we're going to do the conspiracy talking, let Nina speak. Sorry. <laughs> just, I am trying to to uh, to literally just say we can do a conspiracy theory bonus episode. That's not even a question. I want to <laughs> do it very badly. But for now, we need to be done. And next time we will talk about yeah. the, the doctor sleep. Um. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hugely looking forward to finally getting to talk yeah. about some things that I had to bite my tongue on during this episode. So. Yeah. And I'm excited to finally watch it. Yeah. And until then, uh, where can we find you, Jeff? You can find me on Tumblr at What Is It You Pray For, and I, I guess still on Twitter at Bubba Wubba Deb. I got to be honest, I'm kind of checked out of the idea of using Twitter actively. I'm really only still there at this point because people that I care about are still there. Yep. And if mm -hmm, they were yep. all to just pack up and go somewhere else, I would follow in a heartbeat. It got even yeah. worse today somehow. Today, oh my God. not to it's date so this many. recording. And it got worse yesterday, too. And it got, it got worse the day before. It got before, worse a couple days ago. And it'll get worse tomorrow. Yeah. And... <laughs> So it really does look like it's on its way out. So I will continue yeah. to say you can find me at Nina Wolverina on Instagram if you want art uh, at Nina Wolverina with a three for the E on Tumblr if you want uh, my Twitter level of shit posting and on Hive at Nina Wolverina if you want posts when I remember to make them. But mostly TTRPG stuff. That's honestly what I'm kind of leaning towards posting on there. Uh, so yeah, no no more horror account. I post horror to Tumblr a lot, so if you want horror stuff, that's probably your best avenue. Yeah. If you're not a porn bot, you can follow me yeah. on Tumblr. <laughs> I block yeah. at least five porn bots a day that follow me. Yeah, The porn bots don't even have porn anymore. I'm yeah, disappointed. Yeah, what the hell kind of porn bots are these? I came to Tumblr and I was told that I was going to be plagued by porn bots, but they're just empty blog bots. Yeah, that have a, a little link in the top that says top 5.69% dot slutty. Hole. And it's like, what does I'm that a mean? Genius. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh but yeah i'm, I'm uh bubba to bad b-u-b-b-a d-a-b-a-d -A -A -D, uh, on anywhere that i am you can you can find me there it's a it's a time and a half um i don't know check it out have fun with it join me like my um friday the 13th post yeah <laughs> reblog it it's tag funny. it yeah Go for it i love seeing the tags that people put on that it just amuses me nice good. Emma. what about you emma and I'm Emma. You can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and Hive at Emma Panada. I'm also writing a TTRPG called All the Witches. You can find information about that at All the Witches underscore on Twitter or All the Witches on Hive. Um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this extra long episode of the podcast in which. Uh, we talked longer than the movie length, which yeah. is really uh, shocking. We did a little specifically <laughs> yeah. in this case, but thank you guys this for listening. Yeah. Took a very long time in our that's, defense. That's yeah, 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 yeah. All right, um, we'll see you next time. Ooh. Goodbye. Ooh.